Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Great to be here. Um, and also thanks for having the main hall for this workshop. Um, great that you made your way from far abroad um, to come here for this digitalization cultural heritage workshop. And especially thank you also to um, Professor Dr. Christina Klaas because it was her initial idea to make this possible. Um, also to Dr. Reiner and um, Herkos and um, Professor Dr. Paul Grimm for um, the support because um, together they made up the idea and said, this is a great project, but why not um, apply at the, um, for this um, festival in Wiesbaden um, to initiate a workshop and maybe they give a forward to it. In March, it came through, we got green light to do this workshop and we all actually didn't know what it really means to do it. After that, we did a um, call of papers and we published it and we brought it to Iraq and spread it for the network and we used, um, used LinkedIn. And after a short time, we had 68 paper submissions, which farly exceeded our expectations. At the beginning, we thought like, oh, it would be great to have like something like 10 papers and let's see if we do have enough people who want to join. But at the end, we ended up with a lot, huge pile of work. And the major part was also to um, give instructions on how the papers have to be edited and so on. But finally, we made it and we built up a workshop for a whole day. But how did it come so far um, that we actually sit here and that we are able to collect so many papers and already have a huge network that we can get together internationally on such a, such, to such an occasion? We all know each other for years through the German Jordanian network, and due to the invitations of Professor Dr. Rainer Herpers, we meet annually, and you initiated a, um, another DART application where we all work together, and it kind of was pretty successful, and we started liking each other a lot. And then we thought um, more ideas rose up from it. And um, one of the outcomes of this project was another DART application. It's called Digitalization of Cultural Heritage Project Innovation Hub for three years. And it's a network funded of, more, um, of around 12 2023. Now we got one and a half years later. And what we see today is already the outcome of this project. And it is mainly about armed conflicts and war, natural disasters, as well as uh, um, air pollution, rain, and traces of time and danger cultural heritage. In case it is not possible to preserve it physically, um, there is still the option to do this digitally. And with this workshop, we cover a broad range of topics and perspectives, including especially Iraq and currently what weren't done on this project. But now I would like to give over um, the welcoming word to Professor Dr. Erhard Rahn, the Vice President of the German Informatics Society. It's so great that you took your time to come here and welcome us. So the stage is yours, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, dear Director Professor Samir, dear Professor Schnitzer, dear Professor Klaas, dear participants here in Wiesbaden and online as Vice President of the German Informatics Society, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here in Wiesbaden uh, at our yeah, 54th German uh, Informatics Annual Conference. And um, yeah, I'm especially grateful for those of you who came a long way from from Iraq, Sudan, or Jordan to here. And you also brought a very important topic, as we have heard, about the digital cultural heritage. And uh, in 2014, the German Informatics Society uh, identified five grand challenges in computer science and informatics. And one of those grand challenges was and still is the preservation of the digital cultural heritage. 
So how do we preserve digital information or posterity for posterity? Books, pictures and audio carriers can be placed in museums. They can even be digitized, archived for a long time. But how do we preserve archaeological landmarks and architectural heritage? And as we've seen already in the, in the movie and also from Professor Schnitzer, this brings completely new challenges that have to be tackled. So, um, um, so you bring a whole new per per perspective and a dimension to this grand challenge. Uh, so your countries are still faced uh, with armed conflicts and wars, natural disasters, as earthquakes and floods, with air pollution that endanger cultural heritage. So challenges uh, where we were even thinking of uh, when we identified the preservation of cultural heritage as, um, as one of these challenges. So therefore, I'm very happy uh, to bring in these perspectives uh, to the topic of digital heritage, uh, cultural heritage, but also to our conference here in Wiesbaden. So I will hope you enjoy your stay here in Wiesbaden and at the workshop, and I wish you all the best for you. Uh, for the workshop and your further work. Thank you very much. So our idea and motivation was really to under, uh, support our students to go abroad, maybe for a short term period first, and then if they know what they see, then they can go also um, abroad for one semester or maybe also for their master or something like this. So um, we are Julia Schnitzer and my name is Paul Grimm from EH Brandenburg. Uh, my university is uh, Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences, which is, which is just next to Wiesbaden. And we are also part of the European University of Technology. Um, could you go please to... Perfect. So I try to be really fast because of the time and our schedule. So what we did and what we described in our paper was to um, compare the learning outcomes from project-based learning, which was focused on digitalization of cultural heritage. And, oops, if you go one slide. Ah, okay. So what we uh, compared was the learning outcomes of, it's fine to see the video. Yeah, as long as there's no sound. Um, so we compared the learning outcomes of project-based learning focused on digitalization of cultural heritage and also the learning outcomes of student excursions. And we have some students who did so, uh, if you want to speak to them about their um, experience last year, please use the computer. There's also a video about what you want to do with your daughter. Um, we have a lot of and to explain what it says, we are one, one slide further. So we added all um, our experience in this paper, what you should do or what could be helpful to organize students' excursions. And if you go to the next slide, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, um, the coffee breaks, uh, contact us after the presentation. Hopefully, I was not too fast. You've been very fast. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a, a tight schedule, and I think it's helpful that all the presentations um, are really in time. Yeah. So do you have any questions or remarks? If not, we will go to the next presentation. And we are almost in time. Thanks to you. So um, maybe also for everyone, because Christina received like presentations with something like um, 35 slides. We prepared the signs so that we really we have a tough schedule until um, late afternoon to present all the papers. So it would be great if we could stick to the timeline. Now, I don't have to schedule. Who's next? We should be on the... Um... Okay, great. The stage is yours. Okay, I want to get...
present uh, our work, Sustainable Automated Retail Scanning, uh, uh, by uh, Ahmed Kamel and uh, me. Uh, and Ahmed Kamel actually is my PhD student. Uh, so, uh, as you know all that, uh, yeah. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with introduction and then the problem and contribution and the um, uh, research approach, results and conclusion. Uh, actually, uh, as you all know that uh, the drone technology uh, are witnessing a great revolution these days. And we have uh, witnessing many applications uh, that related to different uh, sectors of our life. So um, uh, the, uh, the most important thing uh, to us is the photogrammetry uh, field. Uh, the integration of drones and photogrammetry uh, has uh, a great revolution in these days because uh, drones uh, currently are equipped with some uh, devices and uh, tools like sensors, cameras, so we can utilize this technology in the uh, field of uh, cultural uh, heritage pres preservation. So uh, uh, drones also uh, can do tasks like uh, very fast and uh, maybe uh, more safe than when people do this kind of stuff. Um, uh, the advantages of uh, uh, drones is that uh, it can reach some areas that cannot be, or it is dangerous to be accessed by uh, people. So uh, in addition to that, these uh, tasks, or the tasks that are assigned to drones can be uh, automated. So uh, uh, the drone can uh, go and do the tasks and then back with the, some data set or some uh, information about a particular site of interest. Um, uh, the uh, problem is that uh, there is uh, a lack. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is, in the literature, when we survey the literature, and this is actually uh, an ongoing work. My PhD student is working very hard on this uh, topic. Uh, and this is just a start. Um, uh, in the literature, uh, when we survey the literature, uh, we found some lack uh, related to the uh, algorithms that can automatically uh, scan particular sites. So uh, the problem also is related to the power consumption. So we need to uh, like um, uh, design or develop algorithms that, uh, that are sustainable in terms of uh, um, time and uh, energy. Uh, so the contribution of this work is to design sustainable and automated algorithm that, that is um, uh, accurately and uh, accurately perform tasks and minimize the consumption of uh, uh, time and uh, uh, that uh, doesn't consume much the draw resources. Uh, also, uh, the integration, we are interested with the integration of drone technology and photogrammetry. Uh, uh, we try to develop an algorithm that, that is a combination between Bostrophedon algorithm and spiral algorithm. In addition to that, we added some uh, features that uh, are related to uh, complex network theory. So we will talk about uh, that in this slide. Uh, actually, we, uh, when we have a site or archaeological site, uh, we can divide that site into sub areas. So these areas are converted to these sub areas are converted to uh, nodes, and these nodes are connected to each other based on the paths uh, on the reality. So this uh, this uh, site or this area is converted to a network model, and this network model can be uh, uh, analyzed and extract some information from this site. So uh, th this kind of information is uh, crucial for the drone to know the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the the positions inside the area. So uh, in drone technology, we have a field like uh, uh, path planning. So this is very important for the path planning because each drone has uh, uh, information about all the area. And this is called also offline path planning. So uh, this kind of information is embedded in the drone and uh, can be used for uh, doing some tasks. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this uh, uh, this work was performed on uh, a simulation. Uh, it's called uh, AirSim. 
uh, we designed like uh, uh, an environment and this environment uh, has a uh, five by five uh, kilometer of area. And uh, we also use the Unreal Engine. Uh, this, is, this space of work is go to uh, with uh, like simulations. And the next phase is to scan the archeological area in uh, some Assyrian uh, archeological sites in uh, Iraq. Uh, so uh, this is the algorithm. Our algorithm starts with the spiral path planning, then it converts to uh, Bostrophedon uh, path planning algorithm. And actually, uh, this is very important because we calculated every single step when a drone uh, move. Uh, the uh, benefit of starting with a spiral is to reach the maximum point in the environment or the site. Uh, it means in the uh, context of complex networks, the diameter. So when we, when we reach the diameter, the algorithm converts to Bostrophedon path planning and uh, start uh, uh, like scanning the site. And these are the, um, the configurations of the uh, airstream and uh, the parameters used like LIDAR and other uh, parameters. So this is the simulation area. Uh, just, uh, we have many figures actually, but uh, the paper, you know, it's a conference paper, so we have to be short. Uh, and these, the, the plans that, uh, the, the paths that, that uh, the drone follows uh, for four areas, because we divided the areas into four areas and used four drones uh, to perform the task. Uh, and actually this is the result of uh, the, uh, uh, drone resources in terms of battery, we tested this, uh, uh, our algorithm under different heights. So when we test the uh, algorithm at uh, 10 meters of height, uh, the results is different from uh, the 20 meters and 30 and 40 meters. The best high we found that 40 meters is, is better high to capture the images and uh, uh, it provides like uh, good quality. And this actually depends on the hardware resources of that one. Uh, we also uh, tested the time and we found that uh, the uh, hybrid algorithm also uh, consumed time and minim minimize the consumption of time. Uh, this is the result of uh, the uh, algorithms, uh, the hybrid one and the spiral and Bostro feed on. Uh, in terms of battery, also the hybrid performs uh, outperforms the other uh, two algorithms, and also in terms of time, uh, the proposed one is also uh, outperforms the Bosophilon and Spiral. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, to uh, summarize the results, we found that 40 meters is the better because uh, when we face obstacles, like in this uh, figure. Yeah, if you see in this figure, we have found that um, when we, uh, the, the uh, black line is 40 meters, the uh, blue line is 30 and the green is 20, and the last one is the red, it's uh, 10 meters. So when the drone fly in low heights, uh, it faces some obstacles. So this actually, the obstacles make the, uh, the scanning, uh, three scanning process, uh, uh, slower and also uh, consumes time and uh, battery. So to summarize, uh, we can conclude that integrating uh, different technologies can um, be efficient to uh, design or develop uh, path planning algorithm for drones uh, and uh, can uh, do some tasks that is uh, difficult to be uh, done by uh, humans uh, also, the use of complex networks was uh, very efficient uh, because it like uh, guides the drone to the best path. Uh, also, uh, uh, designing uh, or integrating more than one technology and more than one discipline uh, can lead to have like uh, a sustainable approaches, and this is also uh, uh, like uh, feasible when it comes to photogrammetry and. Uh, scanning archaeological sites for cultural uh, preservation. I think. Thank you very much.
questions. Thank you very much for yeah. this interesting presentation. And you perfectly made it on time. So very good. <laughs> Two times. Well, yeah. so, so, yes, very good. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, there's a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you did the simulation. Yes, and uh, how have you compared it also to a real uh, drone uh, capture uh, situations? This is the first phase. The next phase now he is scanning some archaeological sites in Assyria. So uh, in Iraq, I mean the Assyrian gate. Uh, when you visit, you see that site. So we are trying to scan that site using this algorithm. Yeah. Thank you. You will. Um, so you said that 40 meters is the best height, right? For yeah, in our experience, yeah. Time, uh, but is there any disadvantage when you take 40 meters instead of 10 meters or 20 meters for the quality of the... Yeah, I, I said that it depends on oh, the okay. hardware uh, devices. So you can capture uh, based on the hardware requirements uh, that is uh, stick to the drone. So you, maybe some drones can change some, uh, like uh, the devices and the sensors. Uh, Actually, we tested this algorithm under different uh, weather conditions. So, uh, uh, 40 meters uh, was uh, better than the other uh, height. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, did I understand it right that you were using drones with LiDAR? Yeah. Okay, thanks. You will. Any more questions? Oh, it seems all understood. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> now we're gonna go to the next paper. That we always, I think. Okay, welcome, Shaima Rashid. Great Thank that you you. <laughs> you found us finally, and Thank the you. stage is yours. Thank yeah, you. hope take a breath, Ipi. Do you need something to drink, or is it okay? Okay. You're okay? Okay, so no. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and I'm sorry for being late. Good morning, and thank you for being here. In this presentation, I'll be talking about how to collect real-time, uh, I'll be discussing how to collect real-time data from the Twitter in order to support the cultural heritage uh, as a preservation, uh, and I'm only talking about cultural heritage in Genoa. So, in Mena, we have a lot of cultural heritage uh, that is different, that it is belonging to a different civilization, different uh, ethnic in um, in the province and uh, I'm sorry. For just take one breath. Yes. No, no, no. Okay. You need a break because you just came in so quickly. In case yes. you want to have a break, break first, we just we are ready for a coffee break. Maybe we do five minutes of a break, and then you just want to continue, or you want to continue now? What do you think? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do it. You can do yes. it. Okay. I can do it. Yes. So take your time. Okay. So in my previous research, uh, there is a research in my paper that is uh, linked to my previous research. In my previous research, I collected the data about the cultural heritage in Nainawa, and it has all been uh, archived in the Mongo database. In this uh, particular paper, we are collecting the real-time data from Twitter, in which I'll be uh, collecting the time uh, using Docker container. The role of digitalization of an uh, for preservation and then we all it's uh, only coming into recording the thing about cultural heritage but now we are trying to use the hard, uh, the modern method into it uh, so by that we are using the cloud computing and uh, and the docker container into it so social uh, access uh, platform have a large amount of data about cultural heritage in which we are needed for updating uh, because we want to know if the cultural heritage has been restored, uh, the weather around the cultural heritage, if it's damaged or not. People continuously updating us with this information. 
So the objective of this paper, we are trying to preserve this cultural heritage uh, from tangible and intangible uh, modern heritage. And we are also the, developing a cloud-based framework for real-time collection to relate to nano cultural heritage. The only purpose of this paper is to support the cultural heritage and we are want the information to be available for other researchers into the other research in it. All the information will be accessible to Mango database. So we can do it in further research. In my later research, we're gonna show you how I use this data. Uh, the framework I have, have used. The framework I have been using for this is, uh, first of all, I use it now, a Twitter application of programming uh, interface into collecting the data. And I use it as streamer, Twitter streamer. So a Twitter streamer can filter the tweet. So I only, I define the keyword of particular keyword that is related to Reynolds cultural heritage. Then the Twitter streamer, I like, can choose this word and only collect this data about this, the cultural heritage. After all, I take this data and do some processing and a cleaning for this data. So it's only involved the data that is related to the subject. After all, I own the storage in Docker container. And this, uh, it is more detailed of what I've done. So the Twitter streaming API, I have collected the data from my Twitter. Then I have uh, stored in CMS file, data processing and uh, duplicate removal. The link and hashtag all movies so I'll be able to process later and store in CSV file and then uh, directly archive it into Mongo database. However, this uh, method has encountered some issues in which uh, when the stream API streamer did not find any data, it's going to pause and that's going to cause me some problem. So I have to find a, a, a way to schedule this uh, information. So to solve this problem, I have used a Docker container. In Docker container, I have put all the necessary information I wanted, including the Python code, that including the, how to collect the data, also the, the current tab. I have scheduled my code that it is working every 30 minutes to collect this data. All the requirements have been created in the Docker file, created the Docker image, I have pushed it in the Docker hub. I can, uh, can pull this uh, image from any web machine, uh, by the way, I didn't think that's all the work I've been done on the cloud because it was a large amount of data I couldn't control on my local machine. I pull this uh, into a new host every time, so on everywhere, data I'll keep updated and it's all keep archived into Mongo database. This is uh, just a screenshot of what I've got, which may not be really clear what I've got, but it is shown that I got the picture on the, uh, the link of the pictures and uh, it shows the where is it? the keyword of what I use it, and which and what I use it, the Arabic keyword, in which I use the Arabic keyword and English keyword for it, and the date it has been published and what is uh, being said about the text. In conclusion, we have the real-time uh, uh, real time data framework for collection these data, and it was uh, I have uh, encounter a large amount of information. Not all of it was uh, really good, but it was uh, good for work with um, future research. And the future data will be using on analysis this data and uh, for more research. And I'm sorry, really, right? I'm very sorry. <laughs> it really didn't start. Thank you. Any question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The microphone is always a little bit lagging. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> for the interesting presentation, um, especially me, I found this a very um, interesting paper to read. Thank you. Um, and I had a student um, who just approached me in a totally different topic. And he said, do you know that the um, Twitter API um, now um, it costs $100? So they changed the price system and it's not for free anymore. So I think that's your right. paper was done before, before. the pricing. Yes, yeah. that's right. What are you going to do now if you want to need to pay the price or do a workaround? I'm going to pay the price. You're going to pay the price? Yes, I need the real-time data. 
Okay, very good. So there's no, you, you, you didn't find them. Yeah, there's an easy going alternative. I can use selenium. I have used it before. Mm -hmm. But in a Twitter, it's not really efficient. No, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you already have have a solution for yourself. I hope very so. good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more questions from your side? Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I have just a small question. Yes. Uh, you, need, uh, you collect the uh, data from the uh, uh, from the uh, LinkedIn. Yes. Okay. So how you can differentiate the data that you benefit for your article from from another data? I have uh, places in the data frame where I collect the data. But this information is from this place, the handle and the username, it's all showed. And if I check it from other uh, side, a brief site, it's also showed in my data. I have appendix in it. That's the place. Uh, for example, I took uh, information from Britannica.com, also from uh, Inclubedians, that is about the cultural heritage, like uh, the British Museum. It's all been appended into a new data frame that is showed the data slot. Okay, and what, what is the type of data? Uh, from Twitter, I take the textual data, I also take the picture and the video. But the video not all working, so I'll okay. be honest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Basim, you have another question, or are just happy that she's... <laughs> hey, already. Yes. Okay. Okay, very good. And you're very proud of her, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I said I don't have uh, many questions because uh, she, she, she was a master student uh, and I was in the um, uh, final defense committee, so I asked her a lot before. So thank you for your presentation on this thank very you. interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alan, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I want to ask, since the API is now paid, have you uh, considered using a web crawler, so your own script to go through Twitter and collect the database I on keyword? The, I used the web crawler just on the Britannica and the British Museum. I did not use it on Twitter, but maybe I use it. Uh, this is an idea I'm going to try. Thank you. Thank you. I see you're really very much into the topic, so... I wish you all the best, or we wish you all the best for your future research and hope to, to hear again from you in another paper. Yeah, Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Um, I just already see that there's um, the Jena students, they made it. Um, now um, that's it with the coffee break. Um, I think we just skipped the coffee break. If anybody just needs to go somewhere urgently, just go. Yeah, don't worry about it. But I think we're gonna continue the next round and then have a break. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good morning, Good to, morning everyone. to everyone. Please be, Please be gentle. I'm now, I'm now currently live, live from South America, America from, from Brazil. Brazil. It's, it's right, right now 5 a.m. here. So, so but I'm, I'm really, really to, uh, today excited, excited to, to present, present our research on the digitalization of cultural heritage. Our, our paper, paper focuses on the use of 3D, 3D modeling, modeling to preserve cultural landmarks, specifically on the Hercules Temple in Amman. I will first outline the structure of the paper and then dive into our research focus, which compares the 3D modeling process of a professional workstation versus a standard home computer. So by looking at our academic paper structure, um, we have the introduction, the location, and the comparison, our results, and in the end, a conclusion. Wait, why? Okay. Uh, to provide some context, the Hercules Temple is located in Amman, Jordan, and it's an ancient Roman structure that dates back to the second century after the birth of Christ. The entire area exists or extends over 31 times 26 meters. 
as you can see here, it's a really large area that we wanted to, uh, to modelize. Its historical importance lies in the concession to the Roman Empire presence in the region. Preserving such monuments is crucial to maintaining um, our cultural heritage for future generations, and digitalization through 3D modeling is an innovative way to ensure this situation. But our focus of our okay, our focus of our real uh, paper was the comparison about um, about a normal home computer and big projects that you can make on on big servers or we made it by workstation. Our poker focuses specifically on the technical process of 3D modeling of the technical, comparing the results obtained by using a high-performance workstation versus a typical home computer. We wanted to assess whether it's possible to create um, detailed accurate models of cultural sites using a consumer grade equipment or um, or um, whether professional workstations, if it's or like C professional workstations, are really a necessary. A necessary. Okay. So when we see our results, we can here see the home computer results from this big large area. And we conducted several tests, and the results showed that while the workstation produced more detailed and complex models, um, it is indeed possible to create a usable model on a home computer, as you can see here. And therefore, in our paper, we get more into how this can be done by using meta features, such as using the called chunks, um, to digitize the entire surface separately. As you can see here in the in the model, you can really see in really good detail shape on the on the on the, on the right picture that we can or that we have done so-called chunks and these meta shape features that we really um, in detail explain in our paper. Um, the difference in quality was primarily in level of detail, processing speed, and overall rendering capabilities. Here you can see our result by the final workstation we used then. Due to use of a high-end graphics card, the computer edition time was only about four hours there. The workstation models also features um, much more area that we were able to render, and overall a better, a better model. In the end, as engineering students that are not experienced in 3D modeling, we learned much about working with Metashape and modulation software in general. But however, these results, I think, open the door for more people to engage in digital preserve preservation using equipment that they already have at home. Because I think our focus was to say or to point out that even you can, you can make digital preservation for everyone, and you have really good results when you learn to use, use the software. So, to come to a quick conclusion and the outcome of our, our, um, yeah, of our paper we written, and uh, in conclusion, my professional workstation provides superior results in terms of quality and efficiency. And our research demonstrates that it is feasible for everyone, like um, with a standard home computer, to contribute to the digital preservation of cultural heritage. This makes the process more accessible and democrates the preservation of important Furthermore, the model we created of the Hercules Temple is already available online, uh, though it's currently only on an internal university server. But our goal is to make this model publicly accessible, for example, by integrating it into museums, exhibits, or online platforms. 
This would allow anyone anywhere in the world to explore and learn about the temple in an interactive, immersive way. By doing this, we believe that digital models can play a key role in both education and cultural preservation, ensuring that these valuable sites are not lost at time. Thank you really much for your um, attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And thank you very much, Julia, that this worked. Um, I don't know what, is, what was wrong here. <laughs> here, small, uh, even the sources, I don't know what happened here. Okay. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Loud applause so he can hear it all the way to South America. Uh, um, yeah. Lars, thank you so much for getting up so early for us. It's a big honor. Yeah, it was. Honor, yeah, yeah I, I, I was getting up early for, you, early for the presentation. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. I, but I had, I had this one here with me, and I was always <laughs> Okay, very nice. So, uh, thanks a lot for making it here and to, for participating. Um, you also you see your fellow students here, and everybody's you made everybody smile. Yeah. Now, oh, are there any questions before he's going back to sleep? Any questions from your side? Okay, Nora, I will, um, um, Nora, uh, Paul, you assist me with the microphone and um, you should hear it. Nora is going to ask a question through the other microphone. I hope you can hear it through the conference tool. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would like to know what kind of workstation you used. Was it from university? Um, yeah. So the thing was that we. Um, wait, now I have to. Okay. okay. Um, so we wanted to um, have a server on the university. But some things didn't really turn out and we didn't get access on it. So we tried to reach out to a workstation that functions not like a server, more, more like, a, um, like a good PC you can access on, not like a server. It was, it was with the university, my own university. And yeah, there were really many people helping us, also a professor. And, um, greetings to uh, <laughs> greetings to him. Uh, he really helped us with it, and yeah, that possible by by the university. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So thank you very much, Lars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can switch, you, you can of course stay, but you can also go brush your teeth, have a breakfast. So thank you very much for coming by. Yeah. See, see you soon, yeah. See you soon. Have a great time in South America. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, who is actually going to be next? Because I just received the message from Lima from Lina from Sudan. I have to assist her also to come into the conference. Is she next or some other paper? I think it's it's um the next one is the Kana building. So presented by Odai Al Shalabi, the stage is yours. <laughs> One. If you need something to drink, it's here. The yellow one. Yeah. Please stay in between for the sound. Okay. Yes. You see it here, but stay here and yes. Okay. Good morning and thank you for having me in uh, this festival. Uh, actually, my uh, our presentation is uh, is different uh, because this is like a result from. Uh, a project that done by our participants from University of Mosul in the uh, uh, program of the digitalization of cultural heritage. So you see like many uh, authors for uh, this article uh, and also it's mixed between uh, archaeology, uh, computer science and architecture. 
which is confirmed that we can uh, not work alone. I need the computer science to finish my work and I need the archaeology also. So this is the uh, integration between the three uh, uh, disciplines, three uh, areas of study to complete uh, uh, one work. Okay. Uh, digitalization of cultural heritage now is a crucial uh, task uh, uh, to preserve our past. So uh, most of the cultural uh, heritage and uh, historical site uh, now facing and uh, disappearing and uh, deconstruction uh, because uh, different uh, or multi uh, uh, reasons. So. Okay, uh, why this article, uh, actually uh, this article uh, is to find a clear uh, strategy, strategy or mechanism to uh, employ uh, uh, computer science, article, architecture and archaeology to uh, find a way to preserve and reconstruct uh, cultural heritage. Uh, so uh, our case study is the Arbarut Khana, uh, which is uh, an old building from the uh, Ottoman Empire in Mosul city, which is this building is used for the uh, saving the weapons in the military. And uh, it's existing until now in, in Mosul city in Nenapa. So uh, this is our case study that our student worked in it. So uh, how we do that by uh, making a scanning and using photogrammetry and completing the, uh, uh, the destroying uh, part from the uh, building uh, using like wide uh, angle uh, observation by searching for the uh, the uh, the pieces that not uh, existing now and completing the image and give like a final uh, 3d modeling for the uh, this building so every time we uh, say cultural heritage cultural heritage so uh, Culture and heritage that have uh, two parts. It's like uh, tangible and intangible, and even the tangible it's have movable uh, culture and heritage and immovable. The immovable uh, we use uh, this technique or this strategy to uh, reconstruct the immovable cultural heritage with an intangible. Okay, so the building is one of the uh, of this uh, <coughs> cultural heritage. And actually, for each uh, element, it have should be have a uh, different strategy to to document it and digitalize it. Is okay. So why need to digitalizing the uh, our cultural heritage? Um, it's because there's different reasons, uh, such as maybe the uh, direct or indirect. Uh, effect on our culture like uh, uh, natural disaster war disaster even the uh, changing of the demography or uh, something in the in the city uh, that affects our culture and year by year it's changed uh, like secondly until it's disappear okay so from previous studies, all the studies said that the same thing, that it's like all the road uh, led to Rome, okay. But each road is different from another, okay. And we take one of the roads that lead to our uh, result, which is this integration between the three area. So we use the uh, 
the archaeology methods and architecture methods with helping of computer science to build our 3D modeling. So uh, our road or like the methodology, our methodology is start with the uh, wide lens uh, observation to collect uh, data or as the computer scientists they name it data set for the uh, our work start from even the media uh, journals any uh, archive especially if the building is half of it is uh, damaged or the interior space is damaged so we complete this image by different uh, data even we make like interview with expert to uh, uh, to speak about this building and how it is in, in the far. All this data, data we integrated together and uh, built it again. And also we use like uh, image process to complete some some images. So this is our road. We documented like uh, exterior and interior design interior space uh, using uh, 30, 360 degree uh, photos using the uh, algorithm, uh, photogrammetry that our students learned it during the workshop and it's perfectly uh, documented. Uh, then we it, uh, move it to the uh, MetaShape software that will collect the photo together and information then going to render and presented by a 3D model. Okay, this is some from the, the work that uh, our group did it as a result. Okay. So this image is some of it is existed using the just normal uh, uh, scanning or photogrammetry, but another part is not exist. We complete it from the uh, observing from media or old uh, journal or some old photos to complete this image. Uh, they select this building because it's a small building as a case study to learn how to uh, build the uh, 3D model. And uh, as conclusion, uh, it's important to us to uh, conserve our uh, culture. Uh, even they have, I think, a ne next step for this one, like to use a platform for presenting this uh, modeling. Uh, and um, maybe they can use it for uh, like a digital museum, especially the University of Mosul now uh, plan to make a digital museum with different area. So this one or this group that graduated from this program, I think they will work to document it and uh, feedback this museum by the uh, digital uh, and virtual environment about the buildings, not just a Mosul, maybe in other area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now I'm gonna switch on the microphone for any questions. Paul, can you just hand over the microphone? Any questions to the paper? Christina. Stop the microphone. So you said you um, reconstructed some things virtually. How much was destroyed of the building? Actually, the building is uh, nearly reconstructed, but some part is still missing. Okay, so I like 60% uh, of this building, especially the interior space is totally damaged. Uh, it's just uh, like uh, the envelope of the building is still. Uh, but the inside uh, is uh, around 40% uh, is damaged. Uh, 
Um, and this is like a case study for uh, their work. So maybe uh, this strategy, I mean, uh, documenting is documenting everywhere. But for this building, we need like to, com to complete the missing area, okay? By uh, maybe uh, image process, or maybe nowadays there's like uh, the AI make uh, this, uh, th these things. But this is like a manual or uh, uh, because actually <clears throat> we planned like to put like information on each brick, like this one is uh, renovated at this time. Uh, this one maybe in the uh, virtual uh, museum to which is one of the uh, regulation of the World Heritage Site that when you reconstruct, you should uh, mentioned the original one and the uh, reconstructed one. So maybe something like this. So our, our, the damage is around overall uh, 70%. Yeah. Any the question? Damages were recent? Were these damages in the recent period or the building was uh, damaged recently during the war or was it older, the damages? Actually, overall, uh, in uh, our cultural heritage uh, is uh, not uh, take attention from uh, the okay. uh, the people. So this is year by year. No one care about it. M most of the important building is damaged and disappear. So maybe this method can help to reconstruct this building. Maybe uh, I see in uh, some uh, places in Italy, they make like a screen in the side. So you can see the building, which is not existing, but you can take tour, especially in the side. This is one from the conservation and uh, preservation. Uh, it's more uh, near from architecture and archaeology, uh, but we cannot uh, make it without uh, the computer scientists. <laughs> Okay. Um, any question from online? <laughs> so, okay, thank you. There is no question. Thank you, Dr. Odai. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. The whole animated model is um, on our project homepage on the output side. So, if you do in your browser digitalization of cultural heritage, one word, then .de, then on projects, and then you can see all the output that we documented there as well, everything together in case you're interested to see it. Now I would like to hand over to the next presentation. Um, and it is the photogrammic analysis for accurate three-dimensional rec reconstruction of the now it comes. Mutafaria Minaret in Erbil. You're gonna pronounce it. Yeah, you're gonna pronounce it the right way. And it's going to be presented by you, Alan, right? By Sima. Okay, that's the Sima paper. Okay, now we try if we have a sound check and the microphone from Sima. We can already see her. I'm very happy <laughs> that this already works. Can we hear you, Sima? And hello to Erbil. I can hear you, but um, can you hear me? We have a miracle. Sima, you're the first, I'm sorry, we have to tell you the pre-story. You're the first presenter that has no technical issues. We're totally surprised. Yeah? So I'm a lucky one. Okay, very good. The stage is yours, Sima. Uh, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can see your face and we can hear you. So it's, it's, all Great. good so far. <laughs> Great. Uh, hi, everyone, and good morning. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Um, our uh, research paper is about photogrammetric analysis for uh, accurate uh, three-dimensional reconstruction of the Mdutayfere Minaret uh, in Erbil, Kurdistan region. And uh, it's done by me and Ellen. Um, we have a uh, short introduction about uh, Minara, uh, Mudaifara Minaret. Mudaifara Minaret is uh, 
37 meter histo historical landmark in the heart of Erbil, Kurdistan. And uh, also it's a, a, a significant symbol of the region's cultural heritage and uh, constructed during the role of the Muzaffar al Din Abu Said uh, in uh, the 12th uh, century. And also the Minarez is the uh, last remaining uh, structure of the once uh, grand mosque in that um, century, let's say. Uh, we have a four main objective uh, for our, yeah. Lights don't change. For some reason, we are still see the front page with a title. Really? Yeah. We see the editor. We see the editor. So either you have two screens, maybe try to go one sli slide further and back. We do a, a short technical mm -hmm. check and then you continue. Okay. We see your, the mouse. Um, so it does maybe change you still, or not? You, maybe you still have to go on the presenter of the um, from the PowerPoint slides. You are still in the editing mode. Yeah, now we don't okay. see a, any slide at all. Let me. Uh, okay, wait. Just try again. Mm -hmm. So now. Now we don't see anything. Maybe you have a two screen presentation and you and we the wrong screen is being broadcasted. Maybe just the window, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't see a presentation now. Okay, I will try again. So yes. mm -hmm. Okay, now we see the presentation again, but you know, we see like the editing mode with um, the start slide. So maybe you have to go on the, yes, press this one. So how is it now? Just go through this. Can you see that I'm changing slides or not? No, no, we can't, but you can just stay in the editing mode. Yeah, yes, now, now we now see it, works. it. Yeah, now it works. Mm. Now we can see the changes. But you maybe really have, it seems you have to click on it. Okay. It's okay like this. Now you can go ahead. How is it? Now it now? works. Now it works. Okay. Okay. Okay, Sima. Great. Go ahead. So should I repeat the introduction? Okay. Uh, as I said, Muzaifar um, Minaret is a 37 meter historical landmark and it's a um, significant symbol of the region's cultural heritage and uh, constructed during the role of the Muzaifar al Din Abu Said in uh, uh, the 12th uh, century. And also, it's a remaining part of the Grand Mosque. And we have a four main objective for our paper that um, our paper present is that digital privatization uh, efforts focused on the minaret. And also we have uh, photogrammetry is used to the accuracy in capturing complex uh, ecological details. And the re uh, resulting 3D model perverts the minaret for future generation. And also we have um, that this uh, research allows you to have a detailed study without uh, physical, like without seeing by yourself. And uh, we use uh, three researchers as a literature review and uh, their main focus is uh, about uh, geometry and mathematical uh, sites. And also um, we have uh, similar uh, research uh, to ours that use different technologies to make the Minaret uh, 3D models. What you, we used for our, um, our uh, uh, let's say, project, uh, we use it uh, DJI uh, Mas uh, Mavic Air uh, 2S drone. Um, and the drone captured high res resolution footage from versus angles and uh, with uh, 40 videos and also uh, taken to ensure 20% uh, uh, overlap between uh, swaps. And also 
we uh, extracted these uh, 40 uh, videos to 475 high quality frames for processing. Uh, to generate uh, the prices 3D uh, models, we used Metashape and Polycam. And the, for final result, actually, we used uh, Polycam uh, because uh, it gives us a more detailed model. And um, um, also, as you see, this is the technology that we use it, and uh, this is the image of the drone. Um, our results uh, that uh, the photogrammetric uh, approach yield a highly detailed 3D model of the Mudayferim Narit and uh, capturing its uh, archaeological uh, 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 structural uh, condition with a remarkable, uh, let's say, perversation. And the model faithfully represented the Narit's form and texture, texture of the, um, and also a special relationship and offering multiple per, uh, preser preservation. This is the, um, let's say, high detailed uh, results of our model. And uh, this is the, let's say, zoom up of our model and showed uh, like detailed um, um, about uh, the uh, minaret. Uh, but we faced a problem of, uh, for the, because uh, it's a, the minaret have a flat sur surfaces. So uh, we faced blueness and uh, we suggest uh, like um, higher quality model for uh, doing, uh, let's say, for better results and uh, using more high, high qualities images, uh, and, and it's make uh, the model uh, more detailed and uh, better. And this is the problem that we faced, uh, the blueness. And uh, this is the comp uh, comparison between the photo that we have of the minaret and the, our model. In conclusion, uh, in this study, we employed close-up photo photogrammetry techniques and using drones and also um, narrowing, uh, narrowing down uh, 1,700 frames to 475 for processing. And uh, as a result, we got uh, 3D models with the high detail. And um, as I told you, uh, we, we suggest better technologies for next uh, studies as a leader and um, high resolution imaging to improve accuracy. And this is our, some uh, references and thank you. Thank you. Interesting presentation. Um, all of you who also want to see um, the animation can go to the web page. Now there are some questions from the audience. Uh, um, well, rather a suggestion mm -hmm. than a question. Uh, and feel free to contact us uh, after my presentation. We made comparisons with using the same drone between capturing by video and capturing by raw single photographic frames. And we found mm -hmm. quite some advantage in the latter method. Maybe that would be helpful for you too. Okay, Sima, this, um, the, this recommendation was by Professor Uli Plank from University of Brunswick. Um, I can give you the contact or in case you stay on board, yeah, because I'm not Thank sure you. if you see the audience and see the names. So just feel free to contact me and yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, is yeah, there Alan's here. Okay. Alan's there so he can con contact him. Mm -hmm. More questions to Sima's and Alan's work. Okay, it seems all fine. Um, thank you very much, Sima. Um, you can now um, return to the listening role, yeah, to a visitor's role. Thank you. And we are going to continue in the program. Okay, thank um, you. Thank you so much. 
I think we now had three other presentations. So, um, Christina, what is the next point? Is it a short break? We have a half an hour official coffee break now, and I think we deserved it. So we meet again at half past 11. lunch break. So I give the floor to Mr. Planck. Does this work? Check, check. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so I should use both microphones, right? You, you can use, do a short sound check for you first. And then yeah. Then. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> elf, twelf, twelf. <laughs> Läuf. Läuf. Oh. In Lincoln. Okay, here we go. So, you see the title, you will have my paper. And so I don't give all the background information again, you will find in the paper anyway, but I would like to present a few results of recent tests and measurements which were not yet included there. What's our aim? Actually, we are trying to establish a virtual museum for Indonesia. You find the title here. It's a bit of a game of words. Museum Maya Indonesia means virtual museum Indonesia, but Muma in the abbreviation is a game of words and says something like wanna play. Uh, Indonesia has about 15,000 uh, inhabited islands. The outer maritime borders form a shape bigger than the US and it has three time zones. And of course, not everybody has the means to travel to the few really good museums, mainly on Java. Uh, and local museums are very often badly funded, um, don't have enough qualified stuff they can pay. So uh, it is a very important task to, to do this. And even if Indonesia, fortunately, doesn't have any wars recently, it lies on the Pacific Fire Rim, as it's called, you know, volcan volcanic activity, earthquakes, recently even tornadoes, it shouldn't be long in the mountains. <laughs> and the uh, light latest earthquake in our area was just two weeks ago. So it's, it's a very active area in that respect. So preservation is, again, a very important aspect. This is our museum. And uh, you can visit it as a guest. Please use Chrome for visiting. It works best. And um, yeah, later I can give you the link. It's in our paper as well. So what are the requirements which are to be balanced if you want to pick uh, cultural artifacts in remote areas? Traveling can be difficult or challenging in some areas, and even power supply can be limited. So what we need is portability, low energy consumption, so that possibly you can charge with solar panels. Ease of use, because we want to encourage and enable staff from local museums to pick up artifacts to make 3D models from them. Uh, so it should be relatively easy to teach in handling. Of course, on the other hand, for scientists, we need a reasonable degree of precision. And the size of models, data size of the models, is important for the museum to enable interactivity. So one of the devices we tested is a recent Apple iPhone. Actually, the camera itself would be good enough from generation 12 onward. This was 15. And uh, you can see that there is uh, three cameras actually in there, but only one of them has the full resolution of 48 million uh, photo cells. I don't call them pixels at this point because scientifically they are not pixels. That is only the output. And uh, actually any kind of bio pattern sensor does not deliver the full resolution. It has LIDAR. Uh, 
until uh, at the moment only apples offer it at this quality samsung used to have leaders but gave on, up on them and there was the tango project from microsoft no who was it whatever pixel uh, it uh, was dropped as well it is pretty good at low light photos but it's very slow at low light because it is uh, capturing bracketed images and uh, integrating them. Then we used uh, Sony R7, uh, A7R2. Um, recently we switched to A7 IV, but that is only a minor difference. The main advantage of such a camera is exchangeable lenses, where you can much better adapt to specific situations. As we later found, the slightly higher, uh, lower number of sensors here doesn't make any difference in the final model. And when you are compressing into HEVC or into JPEG, it is applying fewer enhancements. I put them in parentheses because Apple does this more for the general public, not good for us. Uh, in the camera and the larger se sensor logically is much better in low light and doesn't need integration to do that. And finally, we also use uh, DJI Mavic Air 2. It has only one usable focal length uh, that is just the same and probably even the same sensor like in many smartphones. Um, it has few enhancements in camera when you store JPEG, but it can also store raw. It's very weak in low light. You can't help that. And it has pretty, like any drone, pretty high charging demands, while the two other devices are easily charged with a solar panel by USB-C. For the drone, it would take a long time. And this happens more often than not with photogrammetry software because most of these devices don't produce compatible data formats. You would normally prefer raw photographs. Uh, so from the iPhone, they are DNG. They should be widely compatible. It is called something like digital negative or so, it was invested, uh, invented by Adobe, but it's not really. HEIC is highly processed here. I jump a bit to speed up. We don't have very much time. Same thing with A7 IV, if you want raw for good photograph, for good photogrammetry, uh, it needs to be converted. And the drone, DNG again, not read by photogrammetry software, but by many video softwares. The flight passes can be programmed with pretty cheap software. This paper like is prepared by me, Miramita, and my colleague, Dr. Akram. So now about Title, Bridging Generations, is, Exploring this is Virtual... sample, 20 centimeters, not very reflective and no transparent areas, but challenging are some holes in dark areas. This is a 3D model. If you're interested in the model, we have it here. You can later get it. And you can see it handles pretty well the situation. This is with iPhone raw photographs, the best quality we could achieve, but with separate photogrammetry. And here quickly compared in Blender, in quality and size, we had to normalize them. Proportions were very good, but uh, in, the, in the middle of the iPhone internal photogrammetry with the LiDAR was the most limited model. The left, the Sony A7, with external software was better. And surprisingly, the iPhone raw photographs on the right were the best. So if you are interested, you can later talk to me of, about cleaning up in Blender, reducing the size of models. This was another statue. And again, compared. Precision with the leader was, as we expected, the best, but critical uh, in resolution. And uh, this is a big site where we did the uh, in Seandro, the drone. This was the result, and you can see where it gets very problematic because the drone simply can't fly there. There are too many trees around. Uh, the only solution to this would be something like combining photographs and drone with RTK. 
RTK can be found relatively cheap, real-time kinematics, yeah. Uh, but then it's very slow. Good devices cost from $5,000 upward. So this is the result in the museum. We clean it up in Blender again, the central part, which was pretty good from the drone. Another example from a very big studio and cleaning it up and data reduction. And finally, a critical situation. This one again was kept, it was shot with drone and with iPhone, but we did not have RTK. So sometimes these traditional buildings, a joglo as it's called, uh, have very intricate uh, decoration under the roof. And you cannot really relate it between the two devices because of location. So that's it for now. If you have deeper questions, yeah, ask me during lunchtime or contact me. The email is under there. Thank you very much. I see there is already the first question. I bring you the microphone. Thank you so much, Professor, for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to um, uh, ask about the uneven illumination that you face. How can you process this, uh, this effect? Because when I see the 3D model, uh, it's obvious that there is some areas that are highly illuminated and other areas that are uh, dimmed. So how can you uh, process these using image processing? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking. I didn't have the time to explain that further. Uh, we are, for smaller models, which we are allowed to handle in the museum, we use a turntable, electric turntable. We use very soft lighting from two sides, but not from the camera side. That would be too reflective. And uh, the model would turn and the camera would put to different angles. You can pretty much automate this process uh, by uh, time-lapsing the camera and by giving the right turning and um, in uh, nature outside uh, well fortunately <laughs> in indonesia a clear sky is rather rare other than i suppose in mosul for example uh, so we try to do models with overcast sky skies then you have very soft lighting uh, in the case of gunung padang the big prehistoric site uh, we had shadows from a tree on the model you may have noticed um, we tried to clean it up with some baking in Blender. Uh, actually, I, I was talking in, in terms of uh, software. For example, uh, if you use a filter to process the inhomogeneous illumination, did you try that? Uh, well, actually, we used it directly in photogrammetry software. It worked pretty well, but we did not have such high contrast because of overcast skies. Um, actually, I'm working on this topic. I'm specializing in image processing, and one of the main research topics that I'm working with is the adjustment of an inhomogeneous illumination. Um, uh, I have reached, uh, I have uh, developed uh, four algorithms, and we reached like a, a decent uh, um, um, quality results. So maybe I can provide you with uh, with the software. You can implement it. Yeah, maybe I can share it with you for like uh, three or four algorithms, uh, I can provide it for you. I think that you'll get uh, much higher quality uh, 3D models than the one that you showed here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? We have one minute left. OK. Um, so thank you very much, um, Uli Plank. Hmm? There was another question, Odai. In this in the screen, was I, one question. Yeah, Simo, Mr. Lia, yeah, I have a question. Have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank uh thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Um can you hear me? Yes, yes, Sima. yes. Okay, great. Uh we have an actual museum, but the museum is full of the glasses and um let's say the highlights. Uh in your experience, what's the best devices for capturing uh, a place with, with full of glasses and, uh, let's say, highlighters? Well, uh, if you are not allowed to uh, move the artifacts out of those uh, encapsulations, the glasses and so on, the only way is having a soft lighting from 
uh, 45 degrees angle so that you don't have full reflection into the camera but maybe the algorithms from the colleague who just was just speaking uh, might be helpful in that case as well because photogrammetry cannot handle reflections well uh, or mm -hmm. transparencies uh, nerves or gaussian splits would do much better but then you have the problem of presenting them in such a virtual museum because computational demands are much higher yeah i agree thank you okay okay thank you um i think we can continue having interesting conversations in the midday break but at this point, I want to say especially thank you to you, Uli Plank, because um, you're a professor at the university I actually graduated from. You're not, you had not been my supervisor, but Eko Wand, um, your colleague, was one of the um, professors that inspired me and brought me, how to say, just took me on the path to come here. Um, and so it's a really big honor to have my old university on board with you. So thank you very much yeah, for this. So it's really great. And um, I hope this is just the beginning that we continue. I know that Eko is now in Indonesia at the moment, and he feels quite home there. But I think this is going to be interesting and fruitful also in the future. Yeah, great. So, but um, the schedule is tough. And um, let's go to the next presentation. Dr. Ahmed, are you ready? Because it is your turn to present using digitalization of the Architectural heritage of old Mosul. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, but I will do it here by the map. Yes, you are the one who is going Please. to have the special yeah. performance. The yellow, the yellow, yeah. the yellow you the need yellow one, for not the, the pink one. The for yellow. you, yes. mm -hmm. which uh, photo? This one. Uh, go ahead. This one to go ahead, and this one to. <laughs> okay. So the right one. Good morning, everyone. My, pa my paper is uh, uh, title is Using Digitization of the Architectural Heritage of Old Mosul in Promoting Sustainable uh, Tourism. Idea and proposal for application. Because I am architect, I will give an imaginary uh, proposal and idea for uh, applying this technology in uh, my city. Uh, first, I will talk about my city. Mosul is Iraqi second city and was originally built in hill called Kliat and uh, on the right bank of Tigris opposite to the site of ancient uh, Nineveh, the fourth uh, greatest Assyrian capital. The old city of Mosul was characterized by its heritage architecture, rich in formative and decorative elements with all its uh, function type such residential, uh, religious, and service one, uh, uh, and commercial also, uh, including many architectural elements uh, that decorated its uh, internal and external facades, such as the various marble entrance, which we can see here in the pictures, also the shape of window frames, column, arches, uh, and decorative made of Mosulian marble. We called it uh, Al Farish in Mosul. Here also we can see this is element of uh, Mosul architecture. All these pictures represent uh, the architecture of the old city of Mosul. Why dig digitization of the architectural heritage and uh, the use of virtual travel uh, technology for Mosul city? Despite the importance of sustainable tourism in achieving development uh, for the old city of Mosul and preserving its architectural heritage, Mosul faced challenges like all cities uh, that have witnessed uh, conflicts and wars. Among these challenges is the lack of necessary infrastructure uh, to reserve tourist and uh, destruction of many aspects of this architectural and cultural heritage which tourists will come to see. In addition uh, to the difficulties tourists face in reaching uh, the city due to the lack of media awareness of this heritage, the need appeared to employ the digitization of architectural heritage and the use of virtual travel technology uh, to come over the previous challenges. What is digitization of architectural and cultural heritage? Heritage and what uh, is the importance and the uh, technique? 
uh, first digitization digitai, digi, of architectural heritage is preserving it. Be what happened to the screen uh, means uh, to benefit from the importance uh, of information record and archives during a subsequent reconstruction operation. In addition, the digitization process has begun to occur a new role in tourism and media programs through social media and internet. The virtual reality of architectural heritage interferes with the real human environment. So it's possible to zoom uh, in to see a close-up image with the uh, fine details or move away to get a further sense of distance. This process enhances the viewer presence in the virtual world and uh, possibly of uh, participating in some activities within the virtual site. Thus, the, uh, thus the overall satisfaction levels of this method increasing overall classic method of tourism. But there, uh, with the benefit of this te uh, technology, there's a challenge and consideration. And first, we, we refer to an uh, in, uh, in initial investment, a technical uh, issue, and the limited of immersion. Uh, here in this uh, paper, I suggested the application example for three uh, uh, tour, tours in the old city of Mosul. First stage was selecting these tour sites beside, beside its current uh, popular and highly because it's currently uh, popular and highly regarded by the tourists in themselves coming to the city. Second stage was presenting special imaginary uh, images prepared through a computer program specialized in graphics, uh, Adobe Express, for presenting this virtual tour as follow. The first uh, uh, virtual tour uh, include the Grand Al Nuri Mosque area and the site of the mosque reconstruction, reconstruction, which is being uh, carried out through the effort uh, efforts of the UNESCO. It also includes a group of heritage residential uh, houses that were recently reconstructed according to the traditional of Mosul heritage architecture, which expresses the spirit of traditional Mosul architecture. Also, the tour includes the visit of the Hammam al Mawkusha area with uh, uh, Baytuna Foundation of Culture, Art, and Heritage. I think uh, the group which uh, visit uh, Mosul all already go there to these uh, places. The second uh, proposal uh, uh, is uh, the area of uh, tourist forest area, which uh, the city is uh, green uh, vegetation is present. The view of the Tigris River and the tourist uh, casino, also the amazement park, and uh, the panorama of the old city of Mosul. In addition, also we have uh, historical play, uh, play, play and uh, the most important landmark on the right side of the city, such as the ancient Bashtabia castle and the Imam Yahya Abu Qasim shrine, and also uh, uh, another palaces. What happened to this slide? Finally, we have the third uh, area suggestion. Oh, this one. Uh, uh, this uh, tour includes the old market area in Bab al Sarai, which includes uh, shops selling uh, various uh, spice and fabrics, uh, heritage restaurant area specialized in traditional uh, Muslim food, such as Sayyid Bakr kebab shop and the Freshman uh, Fishman uh, uh, shops in the, the Maidan area. Also, traditional wood boat making uh, uh, workshop and the carpentry shop for traditional crafts uh, shown in figure three. Conclusion. In, uh, last slide, please. The tra uh, virtual travel has the potential to significant uh, contribute to the pr promotion of sustainable tourism in the old city of Mosul by offering immersive digital experience of cultural heritage site through virtual uh, tours and digital media showing architectural heritage. But uh, virtual travel can help overcoming barriers 
to traditional tourism and support environmental conservation initiatives. However, the success of digital tourism hangs on meeting specific requirements, including financial and investment support and uh, initial investment equipment and software and st uh, st uh, stable internet connection. Thank you for your listening. Any question, Claire, please? Uh, you were using, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. thank you. <laughs> uh, you were using uh, some 3D goggles, uh, like Quest or whatever. Um, do you supply these, or do you expect your virtual tourists to have them at home? I, I uh, just suggest these tours. Uh, as idea or, or uh, example to uh, another work will, uh, in the future will come. Just uh, want to uh, make an uh, imaginary picture of what we can do to uh, make these uh, virtual travel. It's uh, in indeed uh, now uh, don't take uh, too much in the market, but uh, in the future it will be more and more uh, useful. Okay, thank you very much. No more questions, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next presentation online. is online. Okay, let's see. Is it uh, Lina Emad? Let's wait for the slide so I can announce her. Mirametta, I have seen you. Ah, Mirametta is now, okay. Mm -hmm. I would like to see this slide so I can announce her, but Mirametta, yes. Here so in the middle below, there is a button and you can share. It's named Tile, and if it's not in English, it's T-E-I-L-E-N. And there you should be able to share your screen. I started it already. Frozen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. And now we see the whole window exactly. Great. You can hear me, right? You can make it a little louder if possible. So just, but in case you are be full sounded, we're going to be silent and listen. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, everything is clear, picture, sound, everything? Okay. Yes, so this okay. stage is yours, Mirametta, and hello to Egypt from Germany. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm grateful to be here today. So this paper is presented by uh, me, Mirametta, and Dr. Akram, my colleague, and it's titled Bridging Generations, Exploring Virtual Reality, Reality Tourism and Universal Design in an Intergenerational Civic Center. Um, this is the structure of the paper. We'll go through the little introduction and then I would introduce more what is the idea of uh, the adult active community, how we combine it with computerized tools, what is the app we've been working on and uh, in last semester, and then challenges and limitations. So the, a quick idea of this paper is to link uh, different generations using uh, preservation heritage of heritage. Uh, and combining it with digitalized tool. But why uh, did, um, did we think of the preservation of heritage specifically to link the generations? Because people usually identify themselves with heritage. This is what gives them the sense of safety, settling, and feeling that they belong to somewhere, whether they be of um, you know younger generations or older generations. And... Um, this could include buildings, uh, landmarks, uh, public spaces, anything. But also because uh, heritage is always threatened, right? Either by like man-made um, threats or, um, or nature. So it could be theft, destruction, mining, or the wars like what's happening in Sudan right now. So... Uh, this paper links um, the idea of digitizing heritage that we've been working on in, in the last course and an idea of my uh, graduation thesis in 2018. Um, and basically 
it in, my graduation thesis was about an adult active community. And this was uh, a housing that targeted uh, users aged 55 and above. So it's an elderly housing, but it's not only providing uh, housing units, it also provides medical services, social services. And part of the social service was workshops, community center and gathering spaces. And this was used to, uh, this was the main part where the interaction between different generations occurred. Also, um, my graduation thesis focused on uh, the elderly because they are a marginalized group of the society. They have been excluded from the uh, local design codes for uh, almost in, in every design. And uh, the, the idea of the, ha of the elderly house was to link them back in and connect them and integrate them in the society. And uh, to be able to do this, we, uh, I applied the universal design theme, uh, which focused on offering a design that is accessible, approachable, and usable by everyone. A anyone could use this design. Uh, it also used the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which not only just offers the basic, uh, sh you know, sheltering or physiological needs, but it stretches to um, include self-actualization, which is like someone knows their, their potentials and their strengths. And this is what we were trying to make the elderly feel through uh, preserving heritage. Okay, so uh, here comes the role of the Civic Center. The Civic Center was a place in the design of the, my graduation thesis, uh, and it was basically a combination of different um, uh, content, like audio library, uh, art audio book library, art galleries, workshops, tech help desks, uh, places to discussion for discussion, and a huge uh, open plaza. So here happens the interaction between the younger youth and the elderly. Here happens the talking and the um, the workshops and and um, the link. And then they get to know each other through. Uh, each one is offering something different, right? The heritage we depend on. on the heritage is uh, the elderly's job and the. Um, uh, how to how to reach this heritage was the was the uh, youth job, and from here the paper this paper's idea came. It's to combine an existing academic project, uh, the elderly house, with the digitization idea, through the both the the same set of users, both the both generations, the youth and the elderly, and uh, it depends pretty much on exchange of knowledge and experiences whether it was uh, heritage knowledge or uh, technology knowledge. Uh, and so from here, the, the idea of rethinking the Civic Center started to um, elaborate more. Instead of just having um, an intangible set of uh, heritage, like literature, memories, um, pictures, um, songs, anything that comes and links people back to their heritage, we are also including something that has a more um, uh, Im immersive, Im immersive sense. And by use, uh, this, we, used, uh, we implemented it by using computerized tools. So that just as a quick introduction to digital humanities, it is um, an interdisciplinary field that links uh, different human studies with technology. It could be history, language, culture, or literature. And uh, we use this to, uh, as I said, recreate the Civic Center. Um, so now with using digital humanities, the Civic Center could have more uh, virtual reality stations, 360 degree videos, documentary nights, how to create a digital scrapbooks uh, or virtual photo albums. Um, and, and there were, there are, or there would be a workshop for a travel related content. And the idea of this, this um, concept is to take the users to different heritage sites in Sudan, uh, but not, of course, not physically uh, because it is digitized. Uh, this was inspired by a non-organization, non-profit organization in Sudan. It's called Rehla, and this is the Arabic term for trip. Uh, it aims to take to it. It's um, it sets or uh, plans um, camps and um, 
uh, visits to heritage sites in Sudan. It takes people there, of course. Uh, so we inspired this idea from them. But of course, we're not taking the users there. We are bringing those uh, heritage sites to them. And then here happens the interaction between the youth who offer how to use the computerized tools with the elderly, right? So it's like tutoring the elderly or um, helping them navigate through how to be able to go to this heritage site through this tool. Uh, this is a quick uh, example uh, of, of a digitized uh, heritage. It's from the city of Pavia in Italy. So what happened here is that it, this is a very ancient city and they helped in reconstructing it through uh, ancient, not ancient, but historic sources like a historic map or a historic old fresco painting found in San Teodoro Church in, in Italy. And then uh, they reconstructed it using a Blender and Cinema 4D and uh, they compared like the places of the buildings um, uh, using homography planner and uh, they were able to estimate where every building would look like from the old painting and where every building should be located from the old map. Uh, this is a quick video. Um, it, is, it is an app that uses AR um, in museums and um, it although the the content of the, uh, the the content that the AR works on here is actually art yet it has like a similar idea to what we would like the Civic Center to look like so the Civic Center has maybe um, some pictures from the past so this is what the AR could uh, do for it um, so our Civic Center has an AR and VR AR is when you are bringing something into uh, I'm putting in it something computer computerized, but the AR is like it's a whole immersive experience. You be there in in the in the surrounding. All right, uh, and now that we implemented digitized tools in our civic center, a new dimension has occurred. In the past, in, in my graduation thesis paper, the civic center only had two dimensions, mostly like uh, when, when we compare 2D to 3D. But here we are adding the experience of space and the geometry of uh, built environment. So when Walter Benjamin uh, describes uh, the... Um, the work of art in the age of mechanical production as it lost its war and it, it lost the sense of space, it was because uh, it lacked the dimension of uh, a place that tells us more about scale, proportion, material and texture, depth, height, light, and uh, the spatial organization. So the experience of space is what we are adding to the Civic Center using the digitized tools to make people um, um, you know, like more connected to the experience of the heritage place they're visiting or um, they're experiencing. Okay. Uh, in, in the fall semester, we participated with um, some of my colleagues to create an app that aimed to take people to different heritage sites um, from where they are because it, it, it targeted so many uh, parts of the society uh, and it depended pretty much on universal design, people with physical disabilities, senior citizens and travel planners and agencies. Um, the idea of course was to take the person from where they are to different um, heritage sites or wherever they want to go. And the demo project was the Roman Amphitheater in Alexandria here in Egypt. Uh, we, we 
of course, took pictures and then did the 3D reconstructions using Meta Shape program. Uh, and then we, we did a few renders by uh, Lumion. Okay, but we do not expect everything to be sun, sunshine and roses, right? There, there are technical challenge, challenges and limitations. Uh, of course, technical challenges because uh, it takes it takes a while for people to learn something that is uh, new for them or new in the market. Uh, and of course, the communication bar barrier um, between the youth and the and the elderly. There are ethical issues like the copyrights. Uh, we, um, we we have to switch the sound a bit difficult. You have no more time left. Oh. So okay. the end. Sorry, slowly, yes, okay. two more sentences, okay? Um, I think I'm done. I just used this paper to emphasize the uh, importance of using heritage, uh, digitized heritage to preserve heritage and to preserve um, countries like that, that are going through war crisis or raise awareness to universal design and inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mirameta, thank you so much for your presentation. We are happy it worked well from Egypt with the connection and everything. Yeah, we could really hear you and see you well. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay, now it's a question from Professor Uli Plank from the University of Brunswick. Yeah, sorry, it's me again, yeah. <laughs> just like the last presenter. Yeah, I'd just like to ask, uh, actually in favor of my dear colleague Eka Noviana, who made something similar about plastic pollution in the ocean, what are you using for the AR for presenting it? With which technology? Uh, I'm not yet familiar with the different technologies, but uh, that, that part of the video explained... Um, uh, like they have specific tooling. So maybe this would be part in the future to study more. What are the technology exactly that we could handle to perform ARs? Okay, thank you. It was so hard to understand because we had an echo, but um, let's leave it. <laughs> um, any more questions from you? Okay, thank you. Mira Meta, you're welcome to listen and I'm um, returned to the listening role from the active role. Thank you very much for joining. Um, all the best to you and see you. Bye bye. Let's continue um, to the next Hello. part. Um, Akram, you're going to support. We have a presentation from Gabas um, Tahir. Um, she is in Sudan currently. As you saw, like Mira Meta, she's presenting from Egypt, but from Sudan, the connection, they have very little electricity at the moment. So they're going to try to present the video, right? She's Hello, online. Julia. Oh my God, it worked because we had a follow. So that's, I'm very happy to have her because this is a very special moment. We hope the line will work out. Gabas, we are so happy to hear you and to, to see you at least. Can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you, Julia. And thank you, can you for hear this you. opportunity. You can start your presentation. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Give me a moment. Let me share a screen. Uh, can you see my screen, Julia? Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna start. Uh, first, our paper is Cultural Continuity in Crisis, the Interaction of Virtual Tourism and Heritage Culture in War Torn Sudan. Uh, I'm Qabas Mohammed from the University of Khartoum. I'm co-authoring this paper with Dr. Akram Khalifa from the University of Rwanda. Gabas, uh, please just check if the change of the slides is working. We just see the first slide. Go to the second. Yeah, object. Okay, then go back again, um, just that to make sure it all works fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me try again. So, the slide is moving. Uh, I'm going to go on over 
So uh, I'm going to say that some the cultural heritage in Sudan and the opportunities and challenges. We are going to overview the case study and the digitalization process, and then the outcomes of lesson learned and the way forward and the conclusion. Uh, an overview, since April 2023, uh, a war has started in Sudan, impacting its cultural heritage. Uh, not only impacting also its people, but also its cultural heritage. So the main objective of this paper is to investigate how virtual tourism and digital I think Sudan you missed. Uh, please turn the slide because I think you're talking about the timeline and you don't see it. Uh, let me share it as a PDF, Julia, okay? Uh, I'm going to review it as a PDF, okay? It's fine, we see the overview. So you can see my screen right moving. Okay, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, the methodology of this paper is a literature review that uh, explore existing theories and case studies. Uh, also, we conduct many interviews with tourism uh, experts in heritage and heritage sites, okay? We focus on digitalization process, so we can save the board uh, Sudan cultural heritage. So I'm going to overview the status of the cultural heritage in Sudan. Uh, Sudan cultural heritage categorized into two categories. First, red zones, which like inaccessible due to the conflict, and white zones that can be accessed or, or people can they access it. Uh, many damages of cultural heritage in Sudan occurred. So uh, I'm sharing this picture, the recent damages Sultan Dinar Museum, here the performing art theater in Jenina, also the Umdurma Market and our Industrial Research and Consultation Center that also has been heard. So this all of uh, the damages of uh, the war in Sudan. Uh, I'm going to show the opportunities of using uh, virtual reality tools that can provide no. a virtual environment for travelers. May I just what? Because I think you have the full screen mode and we see just the editor. So when you continue with the slides, we don't see them. Just turn on the editor because we are still on the overview page. Uh, editor mode, where from where can I find it? When you have the normal um, paper where you edit the PowerPoint thing. Uh, okay, okay. Full screen page. So, just yes, when you continue here, here, we can follow up. Just use this window. Okay. Uh, so, the opportunities is to provide a virtual environment for travelers. We can also like address issues like over tourism, uh, like a solution for it. And also, we can unlock new revenue for springs for uh, tourism sector. The challenges will be uh, determined into two. First, uh, we need to adapt technologies like VR, which is something we will take may maybe it will take a time. Also, the main issue, which is funding, uh, to like implement these technologies to perceive Sudan culture heritage. Um, I'm going to overview a case study of railway building digitalization case in Atpera. Uh, this building is located in a wide zone, so I couldn't uh, I could access it and like uh, do a digitalization process on it. So the objective mainly was to perceive Sudan culture heritage by leveraging railway building. The method I used only the phone camera with the Amera app uh, software. I used MetaShip. Uh, the main challenges was like uh, memory issues in MetaShare, but this uh, issue was resolved by converting these images into better processing uh, photos. Uh, the outcome was an accurate uh, 3D model created uh, of a heritage site in Sudan located in a cold zone. Uh, the digitalization, what we come from this paper, which is the digitalization process. Uh, first, we did the planning, uh, which is we select the site for digitalization, and then we did data capturing. We use 3D tools, and then we model this data, and then we perceive it to make sure this data like will perceive for a long time. We need we make an evaluate. We gather any 
user feedback to enhance digitalization experience. And then uh, we enhance to have a collaboration effort uh, with a cultural institution to share and promote uh, digital content. Um, sorry. The outcomes a lesson learned from this, uh, the outcome mainly was an Agra 3D model of digit of uh, like a heritage site user photogrammetry. We have data long term perceived, and also we we outcome from this paper by global collaboration with the institution and user feedback to improve on optimized digital heritage experience. The lesson learned uh, that is this method are essential to perceive heritage sites, especially in a time of a conflict. 3D model and virtual. 3D models and virtual tours can engage wider audience and can increase appreciation of the cultural heritage. Uh, digital perception ensure data security with multiple copies. We can make it like uh, like copies to perceive it, to use it for next times. The way forward, uh, we need to emphasize the adaptation of virtual tourism tools to safeguard Sudan her cultural heritage. We need to highlight the potential of multimedia to enhance post-conflict tourism for recovery and also engagement, especially in this time of Sudan. Um, we need to do like a collaborative effort to address the main issue, which is funding challenges. Uh, the conclusion of this paper that we only used uh, a phone camera and an application Metashape, in our laptop to like have digitalized uh, heritage sites. So the, the digitalization process is not that hard. So the collaboration between culture organization and local communities becomes something essential for perceiving Sudan cultural heritage during this time of, during this challenges time. So that's uh, it mainly. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have questions, that's it. Thank you. Gabas, thank you so much and hello to Sudan from Germany. We are really happy you made it um, and that it was possible and you had a connection and you seemed really well prepared. Yes, yeah, stay safe. Stay and now we are going to... Are there any questions from the audience? I know they all look happy and I think they understood the message. Ah, Christina. Just a moment, I'm going to hand understand. over to Christina. Oh, you use your own microphone. Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I mean, Sudan is in a horrible crisis. Is there any processes or discussion that what you do and perhaps other people might do is then preserved centrally? Is there any process? I mean, what you did is great to preserve cultural heritage, and if it's not so difficult it might be worthwhile to send as many people with phones to white areas to really do the best is there any discussion with the government or with unesco or with people to help to support us uh, actually uh, i when i conduct many interviews with uh, tourism experts which is where any you know, people worked in institutions in sudan they say they work on something like a virtual tour, like a virtual museum for our like uh, national museum sudan national museum so they say if this something can work they can you know, can implement it on many buildings that they will not destroy it till now yeah. but it's still the funding is still a main issue yeah, for sudan I hope I answered you, Christina. Uh, and I can add to that point as well. There are some, some efforts, but the, 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 the challenge right now is that they are not unified. Every, every you know, interested organization is working on its own. So now uh, with the, the UNESCO, there are some sort of, of initiatives to, to unify these kind of things. And I think like uh, for these students to join such an, 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 an a project, very, it's timely for Sudan, you know, because uh, not only the tangible heritage is at risk, but also the intangible uh, somehow, because the knowledge of people, those who are dying, who are displaced, this is the biggest part that we hope through digitalization we can, we can handle it in a way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, um, 
the next thing is that we're gonna have a lunch, right? You should all have the lunch vouchers. Um, thanks to Gabas. Um, we say goodbye to you and thanks for coming around. Yeah, stay safe and see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs> and the lunch break goes until two o'clock. So we do have some time to like really relax, eat something, communicate, and then just please be back. Okay. So hello from this side. Uh, this is more a uh, theoretical talk on some ethical issues. I want to skip over some things and some basic terminology, but I will not present all the details in the paper because in the paper I did some research and there's many more details and links um, described than what I have here. So the point is I named the thing on reduction, construction, and ethical concerns and the point is, I mean, we are here now an interdisciplinary conference and I'm from IT, from computer science, and reduction and construction is an inherent property of whenever we do something with computers, whenever we create software. And this, of course, has also some implications when we talk about digitization of cultural heritage, because here we want to preserve something. And when we reduce and we, when we construct, we change things. And this is something that we need to be aware of. So, first thing, I talk about the nature of algorithms, and this is one of the basic definitions in one of the IT standard textbooks on algorithms. And an algorithm is any well-defined computation procedure that takes some value as an input and produces some value or set of value as output. This is what an algorithm does. So, we have our procedure, the computer, we get somehow an input, and produce somehow an output. And as we all know, the computer works with bits and bytes, with ones and zeros. So we take the real world or whatever problem we have, and we have somehow to squeeze it into ones and zeros. And then at the output, we get ones and zeros. And of course, we need to decode it because we are not interested in ones and zeros. We are interested in an answer. So we have this encoding and the decoding. With the encoding, we do some um, selection. Because we cannot take the whole word, the whole situation, but we select what information we want to encode into bits and bytes. And once we have the answer, with the decoding, we make an interpretation. So we take the answer, the world, the whole world is larger, and we try to use this information and put it into the context. And this is what I try to name with my reduction, because the encoding, the selection, reduces facts. And especially when I talk about heritage, heritage is something very large, or culture, we reduce. And then when I get an answer, or when I have a vi visual representation or an AR representation, VR representation, I construct something new. And this is somehow, but not necessarily the same thing. And that's why I named the decoding, the interpretation step, a construction step. And this is, of course, something that we do always, because our mind, we cannot capture everything in the whole world. And I mean, it's also what helped us to survive. And I walk through the jungle. I mean, I'm interested not so much in nice flowers, but I'm interested in the snake, in the lion. So I'm concentrating on some of these information that might be dangerous and not on other things. So the selection and the interpretation is inherent to our life and how we interact with the with the world. So cultural heritage, we had also the definition somehow here, is of course two different types of objects. We have tangible objects, and for tangible objects, it's easier to put them into a computer because we have things that we can say, okay, we have of course then to see how to encode the, the space, we have a 3D space, how to do the color encoding, things like that. But it's easier to encode. We make less errors than when we talk about intangible cultural heritage. And intangible cultural heritage is also very, very important. And here we talk about knowledge and skills. And everybody knows if you try to explain to your students or to your school colleagues how to do something, convey knowledge, it's extremely difficult and skills. And of course, when we go even further far from this patterns of behavior i mean try to teach your child to do something why and it's very difficult to explain how to exactly behave and why it's a cultural norm 
And of course, when it goes then even to rituals and ceremonies where you have a whole belief system, it gets very, very complex. And when we do digitalization of cultural heritage, of course we use it. And we have more and more possibilities to use it. And we can, this is created by ChatGPT. Yesterday I only had two trials, so it might not be the best version. But there's a lot of people now not only talking about virtual museums, but also augmented reality, virtual reality, things like that. But what happens? I have a cultural heritage, something. It's put in the computer information, in the computer program, and then I interact with this. And I reconstruct something, and very often you reconstruct the surrounding that might not necessarily be as it has been by the time being. And of course, additionally, I interpret it with my values and my own background. So I have the feeling to know how it feels to go through Roman market or to go and be in a Roman temple. But it's not the Roman temple. It's our image of a Roman temple interpreted by how I feel it by my knowledge and by my things. So this is what we always need to be aware of, especially when we talk about um, dealing with cultural heritage of people who are still alive. And this is very often another problem that um, you have concerned people, indigenous people, they might perhaps not even be aware that they want their cultural heritage digitized. I mean, we have some small indigenous people who have not yet have any contact with, with uh, Western people or with us modern civilizations. And then very often rich people come from Western countries. They want to do something good. They want to help. They have a sponsorship. They have their background. They have their education. And they come. And what do they do? They do digitization of cultural heritage. And by this, they interpret it. They, they put it to their own. They modify it. And this inherently has large ethical concerns also. And this is with a recommendations. I just picked out very few. And once this was a paper that was talking about such um, digitization projects of written text in Africa. I think it was somewhere not in North Africa, but a bit below. And they said there is large international information role players. They have the funds. They have the technology to do this. They have the knowledge to do this. And they digitize large volumes of information, books like that. But the point is, in this paper, they said, those guys must recognize the collective rights of the others, those who created the cultural heritage, or those who are inher um, her inherit the things, who are the children, the grandchildren of the culture who created it their rights and refrain from acting purely in their own interest. And this happens very often. And it's not necessarily that I do it on a bad account. I mean, you know, I might have a very, okay, I love the culture. I want to support people. It's like, you know, some 20 years ago when all the white guys came and said, I want to go to somewhere to Africa and help the people and build up uh, an orphanage or things like that without looking what the people really need. And this happens, of course, also with this digitization project. And they say there's relevant principles. The first thing, whoever does this must recognize the cultural and moral rights. And those are with the people who are concerned. It's not with the rights. Those rights are not with the people who spend the money, who have the funds and to do the work. Recognition of ownership rights. Recognition of economic interest, because very often you have the funds, you have something like a virtual museum, and then, of course, with a virtual museum, you can sell tickets, and who is a profiter? It's not necessarily the people who live there. The duty to share, to make open access, things like that, and also the recognition of the right to control, and this right to control should be with the people of concern. And right to control also means to say, hey, you did something with a temple, a former temple, a former place, and we feel that it's not respectful with our past. So we do take away the right for you to use this information. And this must be respected. And this is, of course, a large discussion. And I think whoever does the digitization must think about these things. And then there is just some 
aspects coming from computer science that can be helpful to solve some issues. And one side is technical aspects. And we talk a lot about databases where you can store information. And of course, database technologies can help us to create new schemas, new schemas to map new ontologies because we have culture and our terminology of culture, our concept might not be fit for specific cultures because we are very much Western centered. And of course, with database technology, you have different schemas, different possibilities to map such other information. So why not use it? Why not go and use federated databases where you can have sep sorry, separate databases besides to combine these aspects, to have for the same cultural tangible heritage, to have several schemas to put it, to have several angles to have a view on it. And then, of course, try to check non-SQL databases that might help to cover other aspects to implement. And this is, of course, very good. Databases are very good in this with access rights, things like that. Not everybody should have the access to see everything. Some things might be harmful or also with the past. I mean, there's a large discussion with our German past, with the Holocaust, with the Shoah. For some people, they need to see detailed information. But if I share detailed information, this is also the information of people who lived. It's private information. To understand the Holocaust, I need to have access to this, but not everybody should have access to this information. And processes to grant and especially, as I said before, revoke rights. If people misuse it, revoke the rights and the rights should be revoked permanently. Not that those people, because they have seen something, are allowed to continue working with this. And then, of course, there are some issues that could be done in applications with contextual information in museums. Sometimes you have a small batch with an image. In Germany, there are some things, you know, anti-Semitic things from before, and people say, how can we contextualize it to make sure that this is from the history? And of course, IT can have much better probability, uh, possibility so that people really see this and are aware of this before they can have, have access to this information that might be disturbing or might be racist. Some information about slavery and dealing slaves before. And even you might not just have an OK button, but you might really have open questions to make sure that people who really are aware of the situation, that only those people can see this information. So IT can also help to make such processes much better than without it. And then procedural approaches. Before we make a project, we talk about funding. So we should make sure that funding aspects respect the rights of the others. This is very important, including open access, and this should be put in the requirements. The access and the usage rights must be defined at the beginning of a process. And then we have the requirements engineering. This is this process in IT where you really see what stakeholder has which requirements. We should use it and include not only those guys who pay and the museums, but really also look what is the requirements of the people who are affected of the indigenous people, of those people who live in the area of the cultural inheritance. Change management, what happens if processes change, if ownership changes, if people behave differently, if also what happens if the understanding of a cultural situation changes, who has access to it, how to deal with it. And the other thing, and this is also very often not discussed, cultural heritage is for preservance, but the whole problem of backup with formats that change, you know, you have different storage formats. This must be also taken into account. Otherwise, we do the digital inheritance. We say, hey, we have now stored something and 10 years from now, nobody can read it anymore. And this is, of course, also if you want to take it serious to preserve, to conserve digital heri cultural heritage in digital forms, this is also a very important aspect because otherwise the destruction is just deferred. Um, cultural heritage is something that is also subject to changes. So when you look at this, you might say, okay, construction, destruction, cons uh, um, reduction, construction changes thing, but her in heritage and our understanding of heritage changes also over the time. So it's not only negative, but we might also consider if we are careful, perhaps the whole thing of digital inheritance might say, 
it's just a natural path, one path that is one of these aspects of the change of cultural heritage and how we understand it. And this is the last sentence from one from the UNESCO who said, cultural heritage is significant in society because it promotes cultural resilience. And precisely through the way, often highly evident, in which it has been able to adapt and to develop in the past. And so digitization of cultural heritage might just be one way of adaptation of development of cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Yes, so high. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I just have one uh, question about the information, the use of information. Um, uh, how, how can you, when you use digital uh, heritage preservation, how do you deal with misinformation or falsified information? I think this is, you know, when you have a normal paper and you have an interpretation as a research, you also have sometimes wrong information. And I think this will be the same. But the point is, of course, that you must have means and you must make sure that high example given you highlight them and that you do no longer allow people to have access to this. Of course, the problem is once it's out, it's out. So, for example, you mentioned that there are uh, the wealthy people that have the funding for this and then they can do these types of projects. But what if they pass some of the falsified information for the digital cultural heritage preservation? Meaning when I see the, the outcome of the pro project, I will not see the real information. How, how can you deal with this issue? But this is a problem. You will never see the real information if you see the outcome because the real information is in the income in the input that this is a big problem of this um reduction and construction this is a big ethical challenge and that's of course why people must be aware of it and that's why i started or in the put it in the middle of the paper that everybody must be aware i cannot digitalize anything without modifying it and without reducing it without losing some context and some information and by putting it into context i add some other things okay thank you so much but this think, is not a real solution, I know. Yeah. I think that's a discussion that is very important in our times, where you have a lot of deep fake and fake information, and it needs science to prove. And um, it needs, um, how to say, the, uh, the freedom of research is very important, that nobody comes and just says this is not true and puts it away, because you can see in some countries what, what the removal of a facts from the past means to common sense in the population. You can really demolish or then let the past vanish and the truth. So it needs science, it needs freedom of research, and it needs strong institution and actually, I think, democracy to profit. And you can wipe out minorities, indigenous minorities, if you destroy the information and access to it. So... Now let's continue. It looks as um, it looks as if we have to invite Basim Mahmoud again for the next paper, um, a concise analysis of intangible cultural heritage practices in connection with sustainable development goals. The stage is yours. Uh, okay. Hello again. Um, I'm going to present our work. Uh... Oh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, our paper is entitled Concise Analysis of uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Practices in Connection with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this work is uh, was performed by me and uh, my colleagues Ahmed and Zuhair from the University of Mosul in Iraq. Um, actually, uh, these are the headlines of my uh, presentation. Um, uh, 
To be honest, the uh, trigger of this work was uh, started in Jordan, in the Jordan week when we were uh, with the German group in Jordan. So uh, let's start uh, first with the, uh, what has been said in the previous presentations. Uh, you know that tangible cultural heritage or TCH or, and intangible cultural heritage, uh, two types of cultural heritage, and both are important. Uh, but the most uh, most of the project focus on the tangible cultural heritage. But as Dr. Christina said before, uh, that uh, intangible cultural heritage is also important. So uh, the uh, uh, the tangible cultural heritage is uh, the things that we touch and can physically deal with. Uh, the intangible is that uh, the things that cannot be touched or not physical. It's like uh, uh, customs, uh, vocal music, uh, food, uh, family, and these things. Um, uh, in this uh, work, we uh, integrate um, the uh, intangible cultural heritage with the soft, uh, with the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the 17th goals. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we also use, like in my previous presentation, we use concepts inspired by complex networks. So uh, our motivation, as just I said, um, um, uh, was in Jordan, uh, German Jordan University, uh, GGU. Uh, we discussed many things about cultural heritage and one of the most important things we discussed there uh, with some people was the intangible cultural heritage because there is no focus about uh, that. So uh, uh, as uh, I said, uh, ICH is uh, crucial for communities and I'm trying to answer the following question. Is there a bias in adopting SDGs for the sake of uh, uh, ICH? And also I'm trying to answer the uh, other question is that uh, are the ICH evenly supported in terms of countries or even by the SDGs. Uh, in fact, I uh, uh, brought data set uh, from UNESCO. So in this research, the data set are mainly from UNESCO. Uh, it's available for uh, public access. Uh, uh, in this work, we are trying to uh, uh, do some contemporary analysis or some advanced analysis for the ICH um, using some uh, sophisticated approaches, like uh, I said, uh, approaches inspired by complex networks uh, and connect the ICH with the SDGs in terms of support. Um, also, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, do some different analysis for the intangible cultural heritage, uh, which is I cannot find in the literature. So the data set includes uh, many attributes. Uh, and uh, the first one is the ICH uh, practice ID. So each ICH uh, in, the, uh, in countries uh, has a particular ID, uh, which is given by the UNESCO. And uh, it, it has also a label. Uh, also, the year of reporting that ICH, uh, uh, UNESCO classifies the, uh, uh, the ICH into three groups. The first one is uh, urgent uh, safeguarding list, which is called also USL. The second one is representative list. And the third one is called uh, GSF. So these are the main list of uh, ICH uh, reported and classified by uh, UNESCO. Uh, also, each ICH ha uh, belongs to a particular country, but uh, maybe an ICH belongs to more than one country because, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the shared things and shared cultures uh, among countries. Um, uh, also, each ICH has uh, a primary SDG goal that supports this ICH. So, uh, in the data set, actually, in, uh, includes uh, primary SDH, SDG and secondary SDG, but I consider the primary SDG in this study. And also I took the coordinates. Uh, this is, uh, they, uh, UNESCO uh, um, uh, doesn't have the coordinates of each ICH. I, I, the coordinates here means that where that ICH origin, originated. So I extracted manually and I and my group extracted the coordinates and put in the data set. So uh, we generated the three network models. The first one for the intangible uh, cultural heritage, uh, I call it INM. So each network model uh, includes nodes uh, and ages. The nodes are the ICH 
and the edges are created among these nodes if and only if there exists a relation between uh, two IC edge. Uh, I mean, when two IC edge have SDGs in common or appear in the same country, an edge is created between them. Uh, the second network model is uh, countries network model or CNM. Uh, the nodes represent countries and the edges are created if and only if they have uh, IC edge in common. The, the third network model uh, was uh, uh, SDG network model or SNM and the nodes here, 17 nodes, each node represents um, uh, SDG goal and the edges are created if these goals supported uh, the same IC edge. So uh, the, the analysis method I used two main metrics actually in this in the area of complex networks we have many metrics uh, can you use but uh, since we are limited in uh, the number of pages we used only uh, two metrics the first one is the closeness centrality closeness centrality means uh, how close a node in a network to other network nodes uh, the second one is a clustering coefficient which reflects the tendency of a particular node to cluster with other network nodes so this means how uh, that uh, it is a measurement for the the, the ICH uh, to uh, be uh, like uh, to measure the tendency of ICH to cluster with other ICH from other countries uh, or uh, the ICH that was supported by some uh, SDG goals. Um, this is the first network model, a visualization of uh, ICH in the INM network model, which is the uh, uh, intangible cultural heritage network model. Uh, node size here. Uh, actually, in this figure, we encoded many information here. Uh, so different colors reflect different uh, countries and the node size is based on the clustering uh, on the closeness centrality. So uh, you can see that uh, some countries are close to other. Uh, actually, uh, the results here is uh, interesting because uh, in Argentina and Uruguay, they have uh, th they are considered uh, close. This is according to the UNESCO data set, but uh, in our analysis. And also we have some uh, 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 countries like uh, Malaysia and Mexico, they have a close, they, they are very close to other uh, countries in terms of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and actually uh, this figure can be described in maybe uh, an hour, but uh, this is just uh, uh, a fast or quick representation because we are limited in time. The second uh, one, uh, is the visualization of the uh, INM uh, and the network model here is based on the values of the clustering coefficient. So we can see that uh, some countries reflect a um, uh, uh, so strong tendency to cluster together with other countries in terms of ICH. So we can see that uh, like uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Hungary, Switzerland, uh, Moldova and other countries, also Netherlands in the uh, 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 there, and uh, also Afghanistan there. So uh, we can see how dense the connections among ICH in different countries. So uh, let's move to the other visualization. And in this visualization, we projected all the ICH of that uh, that are reported by the UNESCO to the uh, world map country. So. Uh, if we see that uh, different colors in this presentation, in this uh, figure, different colors re reflect different countries. Uh, we can see that uh, the ICH reported by UNESCO uh, a little biased to some uh, country. This is my own opinion. Uh, and uh, if you uh, observe China, so in China you can see that most of the ICH are from the middle area, uh, not too much from the other areas. Uh, also, some countries in uh, in Africa, in the middle, I guess that one is uh, Central Africa, they don't have any ICH. So I don't know, maybe lack of information or uh, something uh, uh, related to other countries, or maybe the ICH of the neighbor countries uh, belong to the Central Africa. I don't know exactly, uh, but this is facts extracted from the data set. Also, in the United States, we don't see any... Uh, uh, ICH there, uh, and in uh, no, uh, South America continent, we can see that uh, most of the ICH are be belong to the uh, west coast of 
the continent. Okay. Uh, also in Australia, there is no not too much. Uh, I guess uh, nothing from uh, I, no ice age there. Uh, also, we can see this visualization. Uh, this visualization shows the uh, relations among uh, World War countries uh, in terms of shared ice age. So we can see that uh, in Europe we have uh, a, a very dense connection uh, compared to other countries or other continents. Uh, and we have some connections from, um, from uh, South America to Africa and Europe. Uh, also in Asia, we, have see, uh, we can see some uh, connections there, but the dense and uh, uh, the most reported uh, or the most common ice age are in Europe, uh, as the figure shows. Um, uh, as I said, UNESCO uh, classified the uh, ice age uh, into three lists. The first one is uh, the uh, urgent safeguarding. Uh, this list uh, includes all the ICH that is in dangerous and need to be given uh, particular attention or special attention uh, to be not appeared. So uh, I projected the all ICH that is in dangerous on the uh, world uh, countries map uh, in the blue nodes. So you can see that the blue nodes, uh, most of the ICH in Europe are going to be disappeared as the figure shows. Uh, and uh, some of them are in, uh, I guess, uh, in Africa and uh, few in uh, uh, Asia. But uh, uh, this figure tells us that, uh, that many of ICAs in uh, Europe are going to be disappeared. Um, in terms of supporting uh, this ICH by the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, we can see that... Uh, some goals supported this ICH, and you can see that SDG uh, 16 and SDG 8 supported a lot the I, uh, ICH, but uh, many uh, goals uh, are not uh, utilized very well. Uh, maybe some of the goals uh, not uh, related to ICH, but uh, it should play some role in uh, like supporting this ICH. Uh, the goals, I ranked the uh, software, uh, the SDG goals uh, from the uh, top supported goal to least supported, 17. So the first one is uh, decent work and economic, SDG 8. So uh, based on the clustering, uh, based on the closeness, centrality and the clustering coefficient metric. Uh, also, we can see in the second rank is the responsible consumption and the production. Um, uh, gender equality, number uh, five. Zero hunger, number eight. So this uh, rank reflects how much these goals support our societies and the ICH, of course. Uh, in this visualization, we can see uh, the, this rank as uh, a network model. So SDG 16, as you can see, peace, justice, and uh, strong institutions. Uh, and SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. So, uh, and the other goals we can, uh, like uh, when having uh, a look at this, we can see that some uh, goals are highly utilized while other goals uh, not, uh, uh, not, not utilized very well. Um, the uh, other visualization is the ICH that are uh, much supported by the SDG goals. So we can see that in this network, vocal music is more important than family. So uh, this is, uh, should be uh, given a special consideration. Yeah. Uh, also, the, uh, they pay attention to dance also more than family. Uh, we have some other interesting results like the religion practices. Uh, uh, is uh, small compared to vocal music. So this figure expresses the, uh, the, the actual facts about the data set by UNESCO and the ICH. Uh, they are interested too much in the music because vocal music and instrumental music are giving uh, 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 higher size. Um, in conclusion, because I guess the time is... Uh, in conclusion, we can conclude that... Uh, 
uh, more information is needed to investigate the ICH. Uh, also, we can uh, see that uh, uh, the international uh, organization should support the, the other ICH or investigate or extract more ICH for the countries. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe there is a bias in supporting the ICH uh, by the uh, international organizations. And also we can investigate or collect more data set rather than uh, UNESCO to do such analysis. And thank you. Thank you a lot for this very interesting, the second very interesting presentation um, about a quite different topic. Um, are there any questions? Ah, Christina is having a question. Okay. Just a moment. Thank you very much. You have your own have microphone. microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I find this result very, very interesting and also humiliating somehow. Um, but I can imagine that, you know, they might have a process like when you have a world heritage or protected good in UNESCO so that you have to propose something and dance or music is, of course, something that people might think first of. So, but it might be interesting to give this information back to the UNESCO and ask them whether they can give you more private, you know, their actual data to see how it is. And then UNESCO might use this to define their processes and perhaps even to approach not countries, but I mean, you could not just approach Iraq, but you should approach the different cultural regions like Kurdistan and Iraq and then say, please, everybody propose two or three or four or five or whatever main cult inherit intelligent cultural heritage because I think UNESCO would be shocked to see this. You have a list and you don't know what it means. And if you collect data in this form, so really you should approach them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will try to do that maybe uh, with my friends because we discussed this before and uh, we will try to contact them. Yeah. So you have the UNESCO in Iraq you can contact, but you can also contact um, me and I try to give it forward to um, a person that is now joining the project from the UNESCO Germany. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Part. of course. I think the headquarter is in Paris, so probably it should go straight to Paris. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, to reach yeah. the the right people. And you to, know? to be honest, this this uh, this uh, research is like uh, one I guess one of the outcome of the uh, mm -hmm. cultural because I as I said before, uh, the first trigger was in Jordan in uh, our workshop there. Yeah. So uh, you should be involved, you and Christine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. More yeah. questions? No. Okay. So then thank you. Good. Yeah, for your presentation. Thank you. And let's see who is going to be next. Well, this should be an online presentation. If I have no, Shai Ma is here. Uh, okay. We talked so, about this yesterday. It's all fine. Shai Ma is presenting so, in. So I can use the yellow yes. presenter. Yeah, the yellow is this one. And. You're already familiar, and now you're much more relaxed. That's very good, <laughs> not in a rush. Hello again. Now, this uh, paper is a continuation for the last paper I've been explaining and the uh, previous uh, publica publication I had. Uh, previously, I had collected the data. In this paper, I'm trying to do something useful with this data. The paper is about a cloud-based data classification framework of, for cultural heritage con Conservation. So as I said, I have collected the data. So my, the main problem is whether is this the database I've collected can be useful from the expert or by any other uh, person trying to do something useful. This. So I collected the data. The idea was is to, use, uh, to enter the machine learning uh, uh, place. So we use the machine learning into classifying this data. As it mentioned before, cultural heritage have a virus type and it can be cultural, historical, or so social, and it's for different civilization also. And also it's uh, mentioned if it's tangible or intangible. This data I've collected, I want to classify this data, whether it is social, whether it is cultural. Sorry.
The data I've collected, it is various from the data from Twitter, which was the real-time data, and from Britannica, UNESCO, and more other places I've taken from. And it is already pre-processed and stored. The machine learning I have used is multi-multonial naive base and random forest support vector machine and Kinear snipers. The first analysis of uh, the data I've collected, as you can see from this pie graph, there is a differentiation between the cultural data and the historical data. Also, if I uh, take it of, uh, from the religious standpoint, as the Yazidi culture, Islamic culture, and the uh, different uh, this color, everyone uh, describe a different culture. So the idea is, I train the machine learning into uh, classifying this data by itself. So when it is here, this tweet or this new information is going to tell me from which type is this cultural heritage coming from. The architecture, the architecture of this um, framework is continuing from acquiring the data I have already been archiving and using it into filtering. See, the problem was here. Uh, the data I have collected wasn't balanced. There is more data about particular keyword than the other keyword. So it wasn't balanced at all. So it is, was difficult to use the machine learning in it. So to solve this problem, I have take uh, filtered data. Like from each keyword, I take a 15 tweet, 15 information from each one. So I keep it better, even though there was some data, very little information. So I had to ignore this data just to make my data balance. After I took this data, I took it in these four uh, machine learning uh, and do this processing. Uh, the step as it's showing, the data preparation, the feature extraction, and then training the data, and finally the evolution. More detailed approach in it. After I applied the queries on the Mango database, there was some lowercase in the capital letter because it was varied from the left uh, capital letter and low, uh, lowercase letter. Tokenization, liberalization, which is the necessary from the language of processing, uh, supplying the data and the training data and the text data. I have to refer that is in this place, I only use uh, that uh, pre made uh, function from Python. I didn't made it by myself. So it's, uh, the, I, the idea it's only by the testing. Finally, the, for the evaluation, I uh, calculate the accuracy, precision, and the recall. The final result. The result for us shows that the key neighbor's neighbor was the highest in, in the accuracy, which is, was not what I was expecting. More expectation was that multi naive neighbors may have the higher accuracy, but it was in the contrary, in which the key neighbor's neighbor was the higher accuracy, in, as it showed there. So in my framework, when I take this uh, data and put it in Docker container, we have changed key nearest neighbors in, with this uh, database. So any new data will be classified according to key nearest neighbors, neighbors. So all the new database will be organized. In conclusion, as I mentioned before, key nearest neighbors, neighbors was the, uh, the best one. And we have successfully built the framework that is able uh, to classify the data. And most importantly, I can prove myself that the data I've collected actually useful for our, for another research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from your side? I don't think so. It looks fine. They heard it before. They heard it before, so this tell that this tells the why they already know probably the answers. So thank you very much, yeah, for your presentation. And before we continue, um, I think there's always three. Nora, do you want to use the chance for your announcement? So maybe you just come to the front because then you you're also being visible, seen visibly for the online presenters. Nora is doing her master's degree at my university at the moment, and she's busy, and she has a question. Yeah, so I took some notes in case I get nervous, but I think I'm fine. Uh, yeah, my name is Nora. I'm a student at the Brandenburg University of Applied Sciences, and um, I'm currently doing a profound research as my master thesis about the hardware, software, and methods that are currently being used in the entire region of the Middle East um, for digitalization of cultural heritage. And this includes, for example, the hardware like um, 
Are the students using a smartphone with LiDAR scanner or which software are they using? And due to gather uh, profound information, I have um, designed a survey to um, reach out and yeah, I want to propose this for to every one of you who have um, in person tried out some technique of digitalization on cultural heritage sites in the Middle East, in any country, any place. And so, yeah, this doesn't include only students, also teachers, private persons, workers from companies to gather as lot as much information as possible. And yeah, I've prepared some QR codes for this uh, survey, but also posters. I want to reach out for the universities to hang them out in their classes. And I will also send emails to um, reach out to all of the people. And I would be really happy if all of you will help to gather this information and maybe reach out to me. I will give those QR codes to all of you. And maybe yeah, you, if you just have any pass questions, it around. Yeah. Yeah, I will pass this around later. And if you have any questions, you just can ask me. <laughs> Thank you. Christina. Do you also have an email that you could send them to forward among the university? Yes, I will reach out to the universities anyways later on. Okay. These are just for today, but I have some more. Yeah, Christina has um, um, for Tyler email list is uh, you, you would reach even another target group than you do via my project. Yes, I will reach out yeah. to all of the partner universities okay. in, in all of the countries. Great. So just uh, share your papers. So, yeah, the, 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 the business cards like. <laughs> yeah. And um, I also see the students like online students just like say, yeah, we would like to do it. You get you are anyway organized in the WhatsApp group on the student academy and Nora is posting it there. So you will receive it as well. Yeah. OK, thank, thank you, you for participating. Is there a, something like a short break on the schedule or how do we continue? Another 45 minutes and then we have to break. And then okay. there is the official one hour break where we can meet okay. others. So I would very make good. three calls. Yes, uh, very good. So three more papers. Okay, so I'm waiting for the next session. So hi. Integrating the technologies of image processing and virtual reality for digital preservation of disappeared archaeological sites. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about the integration of uh, image processing and virtual reality to preserve the disappeared ar archaeological sites. So virtual reality and image processing have addressed various real-life challenges in medicine, uh, uh, astronomy, uh, physics, and also archaeology. So as we know, VR allows us to create the 3D models, and image processing allows us to adjust the quality of digital images to better represent these images. Cultural heritage preservation using these digital approaches is an essential tool to protect the history and culture. How? Because we not only have photos that we are currently taking, but we also have old photos taken uh, uh, that were taken or captured in the past, for example, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s. So these um, distorted old. Okay. So these uh, distorted old low quality images are important because they contribute to the VR model creation and. Uh, uh, in the context that we are creating objects that are no longer physically exist. And such images, the old images, uh, may have been taken many years ago. They are a record, they're an archive. And uh, these images uh, may not be visually appealing, I mean, the, the quality is not that good, but they still provide us with valuable information about these disappeared sites. 
we are taking this, uh, these photos as an example, we can see these old unprocessed archaeolog archaeological images. And if we look at the image, we can see or we can observe multiple distortions. For example, here we can see noise in the images. The, the images are noisy. We can see uneven illumination, meaning this, bright, this part is bright, this bright part is dark. We can see deficient contrast. The contrast is not that good. And also, we can see low brightness. Some of the photos that we get, the entire photo is dimmed or dark. And we can see other distortions. For example, if you look at this part of the image, this part of the image, this part here, and this part here, you can see that there are physical distortions, meaning that these pictures were uh, paper printed and then they scanned it and these pictures when they were in a paper form they were polluted by water or damaged by humidity that's why we get these distortions here and if we look at these images they are not visually appealing but they contain a lot of information that is useful for us to create the 3d model uh, to preserve uh, this kind of archaeological uh, objects so, when building the 3D model, if we use these unprocessed images as is, without processing, without doing anything to them, we will get, uh, and we will get faulty results. For example, if we use MetaShape and we send these images without any processing, we will get faulty results of the object. So, this 3D model does not represent the true actual um, object that was, that was photographed but the photographs uh, are old and degraded. So what did we do here? We used image processing before sending these images. We, we process them and then send them to meet the shape in order to extract the accurate uh, uh, object. So as a, uh, the data set that we used here, we use uh, uh, a case study data set containing 255 low quality grayscale images. The average size of the, uh, size of the photo was 70 kilobytes, meaning the photo is small. And these images represent a Roman stone sarcophagus that was found at the Gerada archaeological site in Jordan. So these are samples of the images that uh, represent this sarcophagus. And if you, you, if you look at the photos, these photos are of low quality and they contain many degradations. So what did we do here? The first step here is we, we, we considered contrast enhancement, meaning we, we should adjust the tonality in a way that the, the information appear in a better in a better representation. So we used a simple method called normalization, which is just stretching the distribution of pixels to the full range of 0, 2, 5, 5. So this equation, if we put the photo in this equation, we will get this type of result. Next we considered illumination adjustment, meaning if we look at this photo, we have dark parts and we have bright parts here. So we, uh, we adjust this inhomogeneous illumination. So we use the work or the algorithm, uh, the adaptive uh, enhancement method provided by these researchers for this purpose. Next, uh, we, we use the denoising process or a denoising step, this step, it's useful in reducing the noise, which is the unwanted information that, uh, that is contained in an image or a signal, such as sound or video. And uh, for this, I have used an algorithm that I have developed in 2014. This algorithm was specially developed for medical images. And the reason I used this algorithm is this algorithm, the medical images are, uh, the information inside the medical images are so important that we should remove the noise from the image while retaining most information. We cannot delete the small information inside the medical image. So I just performed a, a small modification to this one in order for me to run it to these types of images. And as you can see here, this noise and here it's much smoother. I mean, I have deleted most of the noise from the picture, retaining most of the details inside the photo. Next. Uh, we use colorization, and in this step, uh, I have uh, used um, uh, um, 
a prototype algorithm that I have developed to colorize images, but we didn't get uh, the accurate results, so we used the colorization method that was provided by uh, Metashade. So using these phases, we send the photos to Metashape, and now you can see that the 3D model uh, became more accurate. Not only more accurate, but we got rid of the shadows that were, uh, were present uh, at the old photos, old gray scale photos, providing accurate, um, accurate model with uh, adjusted illumination, with low noise, and uh, it's colorized. So in conclusion, these old unprocessed images have a plethora of degradations, and these degradations can be of noise, blur, and even illumination, deficient contrast, low brightness, distortions, and others. Using the pristine unprocessed images would lead to faulty results. That's why we use a suitable image uh, uh, processing approaches to improve the quality of these images. And better quality images can lead to the creation of a detailed 3D model. And processing the degradations of old images has proven its efficiency in, uh, in creating these accurate 3D models. Thank you so much, if you have any questions. So the microphone for the question is ready. Yeah, Uli. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much. And you made me aware of your research before. Yeah. And uh, I would be very curious, uh, did you try to apply it to images that were taken under, well, optimal but natural conditions, of course, with modern equipment? And did you find improvements of the 3D models if you did that? Okay. Thank you so much for the interesting question. Uh, actually, uh, we don't have something called optimal images. This is a tricky question. Uh, I have done, uh, um, I have published a paper in, 2000, in um, 2024, this year, and this paper uses um, the concept of fuzzy type two, the second type of fuzzy, to adjust the inhomogeneous illumination because our minds are set to, to preserve, to see. But if I, uh, it's, uh, it's something like, what's the difference from a single stimulus and a double stimulus? Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I, if I use single stimulus, meaning I, uh, if I, for example, want to evaluate something using one thing. So if I look at it, I see, okay, the, the quality is good. But once I have different versions of the same object or the same scene, now I can judge. So in, 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 the, in the recent algorithm that I developed, even though I, I have taken photos that, uh, that are considered are taken in an optimal environment, we also, when, when we process them, we get an even better illumination and even better results. So this is the issue. We don't have something called optimal. We always go for the best, for the best quality, aim for the best quality by um, developing algorithms that are, uh, how to say, more advanced. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Okay. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there is a general remark. I think, Lina, are you, you are already in the chat as far as I see. Would you be willing and ready to give the presentation now? Because I got an email this morning that Jan Chak Schrem, who was about to make the presentation, is ill. So the presentation needs to be skipped. And if we can just take the next presentation before, this would be great. Um, because the program was published completely with timings in the official agenda, I would not suggest to put the last talks before, 
but if we can make the next presentation now we have 15 minutes because the next break is one hour 15 minutes to perhaps make a larger discussion if you like so lena is there any sign are you ready could you do the um presentation now are you fine here yeah. are Too I late. see your faces. Allah and Lina, both are here. So they made it both. Hello. Great. We can hear you. Okay. So um, you can share the screen below. You have a button that is called Thailand in German. It's T-E-I-L-E-N. There you can share the screen and then the floor is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um. Can you see my screen? Um, no, no. We just see your faces at the moment, so the sharing doesn't work. It seems. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Can you see it now? Yes. Um, it's still okay. the presentation mode, so you have to switch the full screen button. I guess yeah, it's, it's cool. perfect. It's perfect. Can yeah. You okay. You can start. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. I hope you're all well. My name is Ala Adela and I'm very thrilled to virtually stand in front of you today to present our paper, Digital Transformation of Cultural Heritage in Sudan, which documents the results of our attempts to preserve Sudan's history through the two case studies of Old Dungula and Al Khandak Um So these are pretty much the contents of our presentation for today and my colleague Lina and I will be walking you through our journey. Uh, so without any further ado, and to give you a glimpse into Sudan's heritage, Sudan boasts a rich history dating back thousands of years ago and is one of Africa's uh, most archaeologically diverse countries. For instance, uh, Mary in Northern Sudan has over 200 pyramids, more than in all of Egypt. And our paper examines uh, Sudan's historical sites and the current uh, status of digital conservation efforts in it. Uh, despite its historical significance, Sudan's ancient uh, artifacts uh, are under severe threat due to conflict, deterioration, and a lack of documentation, making it uh, unknown both locally and internationally, and efforts to preserve Sudan's heritage through digitization have been limited, and the importance of this process is not yet fully grasped. Um, however, there have been some notable international initiatives that we can uh, quickly go over. Um, for decades, efforts to preserve Sudan's heritage focused uh, more on intangible aspects like customs and folklore rather than uh, concrete uh, monuments. For example, 76 million negatives of photographs are stored in the National Archive. However, uh, the trial of uh, physical monument conservation is what relates to the paper's domain. Um, since 2014, the German Archaeological Institute has partnered with the Sudan's National Corporation for Antiquities and Museums to digitize uh, German architect Friedrich Hinkel's archive. Uh, his work documents over 14,000 archaeological sites forming the foundation of Sudan's uh, National Heritage Registry, which is, is still in development. Another key initiative is the Sudanese Association uh, for the Archiving of Knowledge, which has collaborated with museums across the country to form the National Cultural Heritage Digitization Team, uh, working with partners from like uh, Durham University and King's College in London. And this team aims to significantly enhance uh, Sudan's digital conservation efforts. But um, unfortunately, um, uh, Sudan's cultural memory is now in jeopardy. Since the conflict erupted in 2023, governmental institutions have been under attack, uh, including the National Museum in Khartoum, uh, which is home to some of the world's oldest mummies located in central Khartoum too. This museum, along with other cultural landmarks, has been severely damaged uh, by the ongoing conflict. As you can see here, this um, are parts of the central Khartoum area, which was the battlefield for some of the harshest fights between the army and the rapid support forces. Uh, in June 2023, viral videos showed soldiers interfering with these mummies and raising international concern. And in a particularly disturbing development, a video from early January 2024 showed rapid support forces soldiers stationed at Naga'an al-Musawarat, a UNESCO World uh, Heritage Site, and any attack on these uh, sites would be devastating for Sudan and its cultural legacy. 
And this all-in crisis has prompted urgent action. And as a part of the DAAD Tazis project during the Winter Exchange Program at the University of Brandenburg, we have documented uh, efforts to preserve Sudan's cultural heritage through the, the digital transformation. So now let me briefly introduce the two sites involved in our trials, Old Dungala and Al Khandak. So Old Dungala, located on the east bank of the Nile, was once the capital of the Makuria, uh, the biggest uh, Christian kingdom in Sudan during the mid sixth uh, century. And uh, built uh, initially as a fortress, the settlement around it quickly grew into a town described as having many churches and large houses and wide streets and uh, red brick palace constructed in 1002 AD and is the only still standing part of the old city, as you can see in the first picture. Um, our second site, Al Khandak, it's a village with many hard gradients located on the west bank of the Nile, about 80 kilometers south of um, present day Dongola. It was a crucial port linking Western Sudan with the river, and the town is notable for its mud brick structures and its castle, forming a rare example of this type of architecture from that period. Um, at this point, I will hand it over to my colleague Lina, who will walk you through the project's workflow. Uh, hello, hope my voice is clear. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm Nina, and I'll be talk talking about the methodology section of our work. So first, the typical workflow of the photogrammetry process involves two steps, which are uh, photo capturing and data acquisition and processing. So photo capturing will go through taking the photos, then evaluating them, then editing them if needed to get the final data set. And the processing through e-software would go through alignment of photos, then the reconstruction of the 3D geometry, and finally texturing to get the final model. So this was the base for our project workflow. Where it, but we added a step. So first, we had the site selection and we had some criteria, which were the proximity of the site, accessibility, project scopes and aims. Then the data acquisition was done as usual. Uh, for the processing of the data, we had uh, we used uh, Metashape, the standard edition, and we used the typical workflow for it. Then when we went to the data acquisition, first uh, was the selection of our uh, samples. We selected uh, various samples, which uh, different in size and location, which are allowed for various outcomes. Uh, we scanned the town's police station gate. It was established in 1902. Uh, we also uh, scanned some column cornices were resting on the ground and in the dome tomb, uh, the third picture, which is um, where a, a famous sheikh was buried. This is a common practice of uh, burying such religious uh, uh, figures in such structures. And finally, and our main undertake was the Old Dungola Mosque. Then uh, for uh, the sake of the processing part, the alignment of photos requires there's it to be 60 to 80% uh, overlapped. So we took uh, our photos in circles around the objects in five to 10 degree steps between each photo, photo which allowed for the needed uh, percentage of overlap. Then uh, we took it in three different heights, as ideally from the top regular height and then the lower angle. We went also and took some close-up shots for details. And uh, this method will give you a minimum number of uh, 108 images, but our data set was far bigger than that. And then uh, as for our uh, tools, we used uh, smartphones with just regular camera app, and we used a drone for the the Dongola Mosque with the, the for, to photograph the upper part. And uh, finally, we used the Pro Therapy website. Uh, it, it's, it's a free uh, tool, an application that you can download to use for editing the data set, finally. Uh, now, for model making, we use Agisoft Metashape, the standard edition. And we went through it with the regular uh, workflow, building our models based on the depth maps. Now, our results, the results that we were able to uh, to get to was actually of good quality despite uh, our uh, resources and the fact that our uh, hardware, the laptop that we used was actually weak. It resulted in longer periods of processing and it, it took even a few hours and um, it was even more with more complex models, but still the result was good as you can see here in the pictures. Uh, we had also some challenges and some difficulties throughout the project. So first was uh, acquiring the uh, needed uh, um, permission to access the site with the current conf uh, war going and the security uh, situation in the country, plus also some travel traveling uh, restrictions. Uh, as for the technical issues, uh, we sure had some. Uh, first, with our uh, with our uh, photography, we used we needed to use three different phones because of overheating and storage uh, and storage. 
and we also had some issues with the drone due to the wind. Uh, it resulted in blurred images. And uh, finally, with our hardware, as I mentioned, it was weak, and we it, it just took a long time, a longer period of time. It was uh, an issue with the electricity and stuff. But hopefully, uh, yet we believe our final result was actually of good quality. So, in conclusion, uh, this uh, student effort, as you can see here, here. Um, it a, shows a potential for a bigger preservation projects, uh, especially with the urgent need in Sudan for uh, preserving the built Sudanese cultural heritage and world heritage sites that are, are there. Uh, but hopefully with the, use, with the help of this technology and photogrammetry, re-scanning those uh, will be a, a way of, at, of preserving this valuable cultural heritage. And thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. I hope you can hear your applause. Yeah, I hope it goes all the way. Um, actually, um, at the beginning, it would be really interesting for our audience to understand from which countries are you logging in at the moment, Lina? Uh, I actually traveled to KSA just two weeks ago, but I was in Sudan all that time. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, now you're in a safe country, right? Uh, yes, I'm in case A right now, Serbia. Uh, okay, so yeah. I, I'm. We are, we are very happy to hear because um, the news from your country are not um, how to say encouraging. To I'm worried about you being there, so I'm happy that you managed to change to a safer destination. Um, from my side, it would be interesting to, um, that was pretty technical, but the sites you have been visiting, was that remote from where you live and was it very hot and dangerous or was it like um, exhausting to make the, the, photo, the, the, the scanning? So was it like a really easy ride? <laughs> Um, I can get this. Okay. Uh, we have chosen the sites, I mean, especially for them to be cl as close as possible to where we were, to where we were residing. Uh, but I'm, I guess uh, the farthest thing was about 80 kilometers, which is, was Al-Khandak town, but Old Ungula was only about 30 kilometers from where we were residing. Uh, but it was really hard to get the permissions because all the facilities in, in the countries, I mean, uh, currently are locked or uh, out of service. So getting uh, permissions was hard, and also because we we were we we were going with uh, private cars, and we were I mean holding uh, so many equipments. We and ev every checkpoint, they were like asking us where are you going, and we had to tell them our story at every checkpoint. And also the heat was extreme, but I guess it was worth it at the end. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear it was worth it because um, it sounds like a lot of efforts, the equipment and the checkpoints. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they've been wondering what the hell are they doing? Yeah. And now you're here with this, with this presentation on the conference. So I'm happy to hear it was worth it. Are there any more questions from your side, from the audience? No, it's okay. They're smiling. So, um, Thank you very much, Lina and Allah. We stay in contact. Yeah, um, I'm really happy that you managed to join the conference and that you have been able to present in person because that was not clear at the beginning that this will all come true. So thank you very much. And now you can change again to the visitors or like the listening part. And okay, um, thank you for the yeah, have a great afternoon. We stay in contact. Bye bye. Thank you very much. What I just said before, we have a long coffee break of one hour and one talk that was missed because a person is ill. And I mean, I'm not, as you have seen, I was giving a talk a bit on ethical issues. I'm not so much on the technical thing. And I'm really awed by what I hear. And I find also the cultural heritage and the endangers and it's climate crisis, it's war and everything. And also what I heard about, you know, the map with the UNESCO, what, where there are holes. There is a need for action. And I mean, we have now here people who have practical things, who are on the side. And I just thought we might, if you like, just 15 minutes, exchange a bit, share ideas, how we could 
make more force together besides of this project to find a way to reach out a need for action and also people here at this conference, I mean, just openly they said us, hey, it's great what you're doing with these international people. If you want to make a workshop next year also, why not? So if you have any idea, because I think this thrives for something to get people more involved, to get reach out for what is happening. I mean, it's not just your culture that it's destroyed. It's something from humankind. And once it's destroyed, it's gone forever. So what I have seen here, it's awesome me. And I just thought if there's any idea, any idea, whatever, and we can also say, discuss it later, but why not use 15 minutes if you want? So floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, actually, I have uh, an idea uh, to share the data set uh, for public use because one of the uh, restrictions when working on uh, cultural heritage preservation is the data set used. Uh, the data set, I mean uh, textual data set, image data set, or other data sets. So uh, let's make it uh, like uh, for public use. So many researchers around the world can contribute to the uh, to this area so uh, this is like an invitation from me to the um, the people who are in charge to uh, make like a rep repository uh, to store the data and this data can be accessed maybe we can put some restrictions to access like uh, uh, putting some regulations to access the data, but it is uh, it should be available for public. So this is very important to um, uh, protect our uh, heritage. So work package for your project to think about how to do this and perhaps, I mean, get fund for more servers or so, but we need to share. Um, that's a good point, actually. And I'm um, in the sh short application I do have together with Sudan and Akram. Um, we have to qu raise the question in how far can this information go into a database? And as you all know, the struggle is not to build a set up a database. This is done very quickly, but how to preserve it in a way that it's still accessible in 10 or 20 years. This is what you saw yesterday when they um, are on the conference dinner. They showed their computer museum and that they have been so proud about that they have people who still get the stuff running. Yeah? So they still manage to run the system. Um, and that's the same problem we face that everything we are storing right now, how can we guarantee it is still accessible as a information in 50 years? And this is the point where we actually struggled um, um, and where I'm still searching for people who do a master degree or even a PhD, because this is not answered in just a, in a homework, yeah, I'm um, in a weekly homework. And um, some of some have ideas, but we didn't find anyone who's now really doing a long term work on it. But I think that's kind of a question to rise, not maybe in a follow up application, maybe in a bigger application or in a, in a PhD thesis. Or we could also think and reach out because there might be, you know, DRD is more for exchange. It's not so much research, but perhaps there's also a possibility to do some research together because we really need to do something. And you're here and you have knowledge and you have uh, background information and that we need in Europe. And I mean, it's a strong force if we can work together. And I think we should think about, but this is very important how to share how to store and make it available on the long run. Thank you. Uh, building on this, you know, uh, what I can reflect from our experience right now in Sudan, for example, at the university, it's quite uh, very challenging for some to get their transcripts because even though some of the faculties, they, they, they digitalize it and they scan it, but because they are only in the servers of this, uh, the university, so they are not accessible uh, from elsewhere. So for the long run, it's, I think it's very important. Otherwise, for some universities, you know, it's totally damaged. They, they don't even get the, uh, the access to this information anymore. So uh, this is very important to think of how to make it available, not only at the, 
locational context, but somewhere that it could be access yeah accessible at some point of time. The the privacy and the security might be an issue, but I I believe that could be uh, solved through the technology as well. Yeah. That's a good point because earthquake is one thing. Um, servers can be just stolen, taken, and destroyed the same way as feasible cultural heritage is endangered. So I think it needs a cloud solution in a corporation to really safely store the data. That's the second point. Maybe that's important. But and you thinking, also thinking thinking of fifty years, of course, the format we store the data today is not the format we can read it next time. And this is also when the, the national data. Uh, natural research data infrastructure problem and they talk about how to make sure that when I have research data that I have to make accessible for the next 10 years I might have to make accessible also something to emulate the software so that I can read the data. Yeah, we probably need a standard like JPEG is guaranteeing that they won't change the standard within such and such many times because MP4 might be MP4 point mm -mm something and then you can't read it. But JPEG seems pretty solid and it's a standard. I think it has to go somewhere else in a conference to build standards for this. Um, or I had another aspect. Thank you. Mm. Actually, my suggestion is very near from Dr. Bassem, uh, but uh, because I uh, look to the uh, work from another view, from architect view, uh, actually in our uh, work is we create the data set uh, for our work. Uh, so uh, maybe if we, if we can store these uh, data sets for, for, for the future, maybe in the future there is another technology to restore our rebuild or rebuild uh, this building uh, not not just for the stone uh, maybe for another uh, tangible uh, or intangible like stories like uh, something from the uh, previous generations so it can be uh, like a, a good idea maybe you can make um, this for this project like a, a virtual museum we can uh, who, anyone who interests to upload uh, the work or how they documented and how they create the uh, 3D modeling for building or another type of uh, heritage, uh, tangible heritage, even uh, the process of cooking the food. I don't mm -hmm. know how the, would, this one can we document it and, uh, and like, a, yeah. Uh, also, uh, I, I think the virtual museum also can 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 be like or platform. I don't know for the v, uh, VR uh, or virtual reality uh, for the heritage for the scientific, not just for because there's uh, I search and I find many platform just to upload it uh, using the mobile phone or something very quick, uh, not uh, not in good quality. But what I mean the the process of getting this uh, product or the uh, 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 objects. So it's uh, more than the object itself. So, yeah, yes. that's also an interesting point because the moment we do it virtually, like um, Eko Van brought me on the idea to work with Frame VR, and I really like the tool. But the point is, the moment Frame VR doesn't have enough money anymore, the people just close down the platform, and then that's yeah. it. That so a lot of platforms where you upload stuff and it's a cloud-based is depending on somebody who pays for the solution. And the money, uh, the the moment the money is disappears, they close down the platform, and then there's another kind of destruction. Yeah, so it disappears again. And that's one thing with metaverse or everything that is virtual that is so, so much, um, how to say, um, beta, beta version. So, so much um, not established that you are afraid like two years later things and solution disappear again. So you hear something, it's kind of a hype and two or three year, years later it disappeared. And some standards stay, like I said, JPEG or JavaScript. Everybody says like JavaScript. But it's still there, yeah. Um, so to find out which is really adorable, 
solution and to store the data. Um, I think it's uh, we have been rising quite interesting uh, points. Um, I'm, I'm gonna um, write them down and do a documentary about it so we don't forget them, but we won't solve them right yes. before the coffee and cake. Yes. Yeah. I have just <laughs> another thing that we might think about. I don't know whether something exists, but I was very much impressed also by your talk, you know, archaeologic, architect, everything. So, I mean, what we are talking about, we are talking about something that is very dear to us because cultural heritage is us as a human being. It's us. So, and what are we talking about? We're talking about a highly interdisciplinary topic and a highly international topic and intercultural topic. Now, I wonder whether there is already some kind like where people can meet, you know, just thinking about creating an open somehow where we can say we're starting point platform where people can say, hey, I have this data, or I'm interested in this. And then I would be interested in somebody, master student from somebody, a PhD student or a researcher, just to meet and create this intercultural interdisciplinary context and in the end if we meet among cultures if we meet among disciplines this is also the core to create peace and i think this is we, we could say why not try to say hey we are very small core but we try to spread the thing so that people can meet can meet and work on something with students from different countries, what we do in the Project Innovation Hub, but just think about how we could make a platform to reach out so that people who are not part of the project but can say, hey, I have an idea, is there somebody interested to do something small, larger, whatever. Okay, but I think this is now time for the coffee break. See you in one hour. <laughs> And for the last part session. Uh, no, one hour. This coffee break here is one hour, so half past four, and it's in the program, and I don't want to shorten it. So if somebody wants to listen to the last talk so that they don't miss them. See you. Uh, the floor, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alain. Uh, I'm a student at the Tishka International University in Erbil, uh, in Iraq. Uh, I'm going to present this paper that I co-authored with my friend Shadi. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, she couldn't be here. So I'm going to uh, present it for the uh, on behalf on the both of us. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So in the introduction, of course, I we talk about the importance of digitalization uh, of cultural heritage, but uh, all the presentations today already talked about that, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time on that. And also, we've been at this program for more than a year, so I think we all understand this. So, but also, I, I have to say that uh, the documentation of cultural heritage uh, artifacts has been—I mean, it has been around for a while, but uh, due to the emergence of new technologies, uh, now it's, it has uh, the field has uh, flourished. So now we have so much new technologies and methods to, we can use for this purpose. So it's really amazing. So in the paper, we um, talk about these four methods. So there's photogrammetry, which is basically uh, taking photos, uh, as the name suggests, uh, taking photos of objects and then by using that triangula triangula triangulation uh, process, we, which is uh, finding uh, the distance between two points. Uh, we use this to create uh, 3D objects from it. And then uh, there's LIDAR, which stands for light, uh, uh, light, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, light detection and raging, arranging. Uh, and LIDAR, basically the way it works is uh, it uses light, you know, so it's really fast because it's at the speed of light, which is like uh, more than 300, uh, thousand kilometers per second. Uh, so basically it sends a photon or like, let's say a laser beam. And then it, when it reflects back, uh, because we know the speed of light and uh, we know the time that it took to come back, by that we calculate uh, the distance. So it's really cool. And then there's structured light. So structured light is uh, we emit, let's say a pattern of light onto objects. So we have a projectors just like these ones. We, there's a pattern we, uh, we put, uh, projected on the, uh, on the object. And then we, 
we see the distortions, distortions. So we use cameras, one or more cameras. We see the distortions and then we calculate, uh, we create a 3D model of it. And also, of course, there's a CT scan, uh, which is mostly used for in medicine for uh, diagnostics. Uh, uh, but it's also like they are, there, there has been cases where it has been, um, it has been employed in uh, cultural heritage. So uh, the, the main objective is basically to identify the optimal because uh, for different objects, for different artifacts, we have, we, we need to think about uh, the methods that we want to use because we cannot just use any method because some of them, for example, require more attention to uh, texture and color while others, we, we want to get the geometrical data. So we need to really think about it. So basically we want to identify the optimal uh, applications of each of these methods. Now, this is not exactly a comparative analysis. It's mainly uh, basically uh, here are the facts and do what you want to do with it. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to go into the methodology a lot, so I'm just going to go straight to the results. Uh, so for photogrammetry, we found that the, um, basically the advantage of photogrammetry in, in the case studies has been it's highly portable. So of course, because we can perform this from our phones. So this is really portable or cameras. So this is all really it takes or drones, which are all very portable. And of course, they are cost effective and uh, captures color. So this is really important for, uh, for cultural heritage artifacts. And the cost effectiveness, even if we have a large area, so we don't really need to use uh, helicopters or um, there are actually having some studies. So there's uh, lately there has been the balloon based uh, photo, photogrammetry devices. So basically it's a helium balloon. So it's kind of sounds like a, kind of sounds like a cartoon, but it's actually real, it has been used. So it's helium balloon and there's a camera which captures color and everything. So it's really cool. And then, but uh, one of the limitations that we have identified is that it uh, depends too much on uh, the camera quality. Now, of course you could use basically any camera to do this, but uh, the results, when the results come out, uh, there's a huge difference. So you have to be careful with that. And of course the optimal application is when we want a highly accurate representation of texture and color, which as I said, is really important in cultural heritage because for some, we want to preserve something for some for, for uh, applications in tourism. This is really important because we want to show the, 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 let's say a tourist, the exact how it looked or how it looks. So yeah. Now uh, LiDAR, of course, the advantage is that it's really, really fast because it's uh, it works at the speed of light. So you can basically put the device here and then it just scans all the surroundings. And actually, we use this in Brandenburg to, uh, when in the project week. Uh, uh, it, it was really cool like to see it work because it's really fast. It takes about, let's say, it, in a large area, it might take five minutes, which is uh, not a lot for a large area. So it's really cool. And also it's semi-portable. So uh, of course, there's also airborne LiDAR, which is, uh, used for larger areas, but usually they're really uh, portable. But the problem uh, is that sometimes uh, air molecules or dust can interfere with the photons. So this has not actually been uh, talked about a lot in the literature. So, but it's still uh, it's still an issue that uh, that could arise potentially theoretically. And then uh, of, it, it cannot detect color. So it, it can actually, like if you have a LiDAR device, we can employ some sort of uh, RGB camera with it. So by this, so it's kind of like, uh, so we can use this to map the color to the, to the point uh, cloud. Well, so, but it's an extension. So it, it of course costs more money. And then the optimal applications are surveying archeological sites and scanning large objects. So there's actually, for example, um, there has been a really interesting study in Rastatt uh, in here in Germany. Uh, so they scanned a forest area. So there were ridge and bor burrows uh, that you cannot see with your naked eye, but using LIDAR, uh, you could see them clearly that they, they date back to centuries ago. So if, uh, you cannot do this with photogrammetry, but you can do it with LiDAR. So it's um, really interesting. And uh, for structured light, as I said, structured light is uh, we put a pattern on, a, uh, on an object and then we look at the distortions. Um, 
it's really the resolution is high and it's really high precision. So, for example, if we if we have a, an object that we want to get the geometrical data, so it's really good because, as I said, it just reads the distortion, so it could it would be really accurate. But it cannot capture text and uh, texture and color, uh, just like lidar. And uh, but and also, it's uh, the sensor is sensitive to light, so you got to be really careful. You have to have a really uh, you you have to set it up really carefully to avoid problems with uh, with light that are not part of the projector. And uh, the optimal application of of course is like for some when we have a uh, uh, let's say a weak structure, so non-contact. So this is really good for that. And uh, when we want a detailed geometrical uh, shape of the of the object. And computer tomography, CT, uh, which uh, is more used in uh, diagnostics in medicine, uh, it, the good thing about it is that it uh, surveys the entire object at once. So I, I don't know if uh, in CT scans, uh, so I don't know if uh, you have uh, been in one, but it makes a lot of noise because uh, the X-ray is moving really fast around the object, so it's all, all the object at once. And there are some uh, receivers uh, that uh, act for the uh, radio uh, waves. And uh, but the problem, a big problem with it is that there is a limited availability. So most of them are for medicine. So no one has developed, no company um, uh, has developed specialized equipment uh, that are like let's say perfect for uh, or optimal for. Uh, uh, for cultural heritage. So we basically we need two things. First, we need mobile ones so that we can move them around for cultural heritage. And also, uh, we need one that has a high photon energy emission. Because the ones that we have for medicine, they are made for the human body. So the human body is just uh, the, the devices have a really low photon e emission uh, energy. So this cannot work, let's say, for metallic or thick objects, which are usually the case uh, for cultural heritage. So we need ones that are high energy in this regard. And uh, uh, the optimal application of this is uh, analyzing the internal structures of uh, artifacts. So this is really important because especially in Japan, Japanese cultural heritage has a lot of uh, interesting, uh, interesting things that when you look at the inside, you the structure is really different, so to make the object really compact. Uh, so this is really interesting, and uh, so we can also use this for diagnostics, so to see uh, if there's any faults or any weak or loose parts in the, in the artifact. So this is perfect for that. And uh, as a conclusion, there are basically three remarks. Uh, the first is that uh, because photogrammetry, light art, and structures like they cannot uh, uh, I mean, they are ideal for preservation. Uh, so, for example, we have artifacts uh, that we want to preserve for the future, but uh, CT excels more at uh, diagnose, diagnostics. So this is one of the main points. And also then, uh, because LiDAR and structured light, they cannot capture color. So in this regard, photogrammetry is better be used. So which is usually, as I said, the case in cultural heritage. And then finally, uh, computer tomography or CT, um, is less common in cultural heritage to the to due to the fact that we don't have specialized equipment. So in this front, it really lags behind. So we really need to. Uh, there needs to be progress in this area to develop uh, specialized equipment for for uh, for this field. And uh, for future research directions, of course, there are many more methods that uh, we cannot encapsulate in this paper. And of course, uh, we had a 10-page limit. Actually, our initial version was about 13 pages. We had to narrow it down. There's so much interesting stuff and many more methods that we just couldn't uh, contain inside of uh, this paper. And in the future, we hope there will be uh, more that encapsulate uh, more of this. And thank you very much. And there's questions. Thank you very much for this presentation. Yeah, and again, congratulations to the best Arab student paper. Yeah, you to much. you. Um, and um, questions? I already see. I don't know who has been first. Um, yeah. Okay, Simon. So you said that for the um, computer top. I don't know what is the CT method. Um, for thick or metallic objects, we yeah. need more energy, something like this, or yeah. more um, with more energy. 
is it already developed and just have to be built or does it have to be developed first? Yeah, there has been, uh, it has been developed, but not a lot. So it's mostly been developed, let's say more for research purposes, not uh, commercially. So that's okay. the problem with this. So no company has really uh, commercialized this. Okay, but the technique is already there. Just yes, you can absolutely do it. So the physics allows it, All right, as thanks. far as I'm aware. Okay, Christina, you have your own. <laughs> yeah. I have one question regarding the size, because I can imagine, I mean, you talked about texture and internal structure and things like that, but perhaps some of the techniques are better suited for large objects or for small objects. Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, what is your recommendation for tiny objects, medium-sized, large objects, buildings? Yeah, uh, for uh, let's say small objects, actually let's say mid-sized objects, uh, I think uh, according to the literature, uh, computer, uh, uh, no, sorry, structured light seems to be really suited for this. So for example, in Turkey uh, in 2007, they, they really made a really nice uh, uh, 3D model of the Weary Hercules stat statue. So it's uh, actually it's part, part, they could only do part of it because one part of it was in Boston, and but then it was returned. So yeah, for me, uh, but for big ones, uh, as I talked about, LiDAR is really good for that because it's fast. So it's not like that, for for example, photogrammetry could be slow because you need to, uh, you know, we, you need to capture a lot of uh, pictures from different angles. But for large objects, absolutely, LiDAR, I think, is uh, the optimal solution. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, interested in, uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, talking about the computer tomography, uh, actually, when this device was invented in the late 70s, uh, it, it uses a high uh, dosage of uh, photons, right? So now you are saying if you if you want to use it for uh, uh, for digital preservation, you need to increase the photon count, right? Yes. But if you increase the photon count, because of the way this device works, it uses X-ray, meaning if you use the photon count, the, the thing that you are going to scan is going to be radiating. Right. And how is this uh, possible? Because most of the research done with the computer tomography is going to the opposite way, reducing the pho photon count, reducing the dosage of X-ray, okay? Right. So it, the, the, the scan becomes more safe for people, like old people, children, and so forth. And therefore, there are a lot of devices now we use. It's called low-dose computed tomography. So if you use it in, in, uh, in scanning the objects, you need to increase the photon count, meaning you will increase the radiation. How is this going to be possible? Thank you. I, I think when we reduce the the photon uh, energy, maybe it's more better for human anatomy. Of course, it's understandable. But uh, for cultural heritage, maybe uh, I'm of course I'm not an expert in this uh, matter. But maybe we need to find some balance so not to radiate the ob uh, the object from uh, so but higher than the ones that we use for uh, human anatomy. Uh, this is the issue. It's a trade-off. Right. If you the X-ray use uh, the CT scan uses X-ray. X-ray is similar to the light when you use your camera. If you reduce the light, you'll get degraded photos. If you increase the light, you'll get better quality photos. Right. Right. So for the metal or uh, other types of objects like stone, if you going to scan them with the CT scan, and you increase the amount of X-ray these objects will become radi radiating, meaning the, it's similar if you expose these objects to a nuclear bomb. So how is this possible for digital uh, cultural preservation? This was the issue. Yeah, Thank you so much. I don't think we will reach there. So I don't think we need as much energy as that. At the beginning, uh, actually, the, the two people invented this device, and they they, t they took the Nobel Prize for inventing this right. device. The the initial studies on this device is that when 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 they scanned the people from every ten persons that were scanned with this device, one of them get cancer because of this device, because it, the radiation amount was too much. So this is the issue. You, you should reduce the radiation and increase the quality. This is the issue. But uh, uh, is the amount of radiation necessarily 
related to the energy of photon emission? Yeah, because uh, radiation here and the X-ray here is similar to the light that you use it for your photo. You increase the light, better quality. Reduce the light, less quality. This is the issue. Right. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, very interesting. And deep into details, we came, <laughs> meanwhile. Hmm? Uh, just allow me a short remark on this. Uh, it's absolutely true that for a certain size of object, and especially when it's metal, uh, I think it's not really feasible. But X-ray is used for uh, checking internal damage in many fields of the industry. Uh, to a degree where it not yet becomes a radioactive, the object. And I think we uh, there would be a medium level which you could use for internal structure. But as you already remarked, there's not much of a market for such devices. And so they are not commercially available. But it would be possible. I, I'm with him there. <laughs> May, maybe not for metals. <laughs> Okay, thank you for this interesting discussion, so yeah, <laughs> and let's go ahead. So the next talk is online, Dua, you're already locked in, so I will stop sharing, try to make yourself visible and we will test the sound and you have now the right, you can share the screen. If you go below, you see something but Thailand, T-E-I-L-E-N. This should allow you to share your screen. Hello. Hello. How are you? Um, please, the screen you is share not this? yet shared. We don't see anything. What? You did not yet share the screen. We need to see I, your can slides. You, can, can you share it from, uh, okay. from there? I will try yes, whether please. we can do uh, without removing your... Okay, I will try also to... Uh, I, okay, then I, we see you not so large, but I can perhaps... Okay. So uh, then I try to keep up to date with your changing the slides. So. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Just give me a sign when I have to change, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Dr. Um, Akram is helping out. Hello, it's... Uh, hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dua Abdel Halim. Uh, I will present Capturing the Past, Photogrammetry for Safeguarding Sudanese Cultural Heritage Digitally. We wrote this paper, me, Dua Abdel Halim from the University of Khartoum and Dr. Akram from the University of Rwanda. Next. The primary objective of this study is to investigate the feasibility of applying close-range photogrammetry to preserve cultural heritage in Sudan, considering existing research and the conducted case studies. The study analyzes the advantages and disadvantages of using close-range photogrammetry for this purpose and explores the potential and challenges involved. Two case studies were conducted, uh, presented, uh, providing technical information on the documentation process and explaining the approach to data acquisition, uh, from data acquisition to the final product. Yes. Um, Sudan is a country with cultural diversity, a remarkable history, and a rich archaeological heritage. Um, it has a lot of uh, archaeological sites from the first kingdom of Kush, the second kingdom of Kush, the new kingdom of New Meretic in northern Sudan, the French Sultanate of Sinar in western and central Sudan, and Port of Sawakin in eastern Sudan. All of these sites prove the richness of this region's history and the importance of Sudanese cultural heritage. Next. Despite rich history, Sudanese cultural heritage remains unknown locally internationally and only nine sites out of 46 archaeological sites were nominated as world heritage sites by the world heritage center of unesco whc as a result heritage sites have become increasingly vulnerable to various risks such as armed conflicts and natural disaster 
while continuous war is a direct threat, neglecting the protection and restoration is another type of threat to tangible cultural heritage. You might saw the pictures, uh, most of the uh, heritage is destroyed, regardless of the conflict. Um, since the start of the ongoing war in April 2023, a significant number of historical sites and museums have been partially or completely destroyed, particularly in Khartoum and the Darfur region. A large number of historical buildings, museums, and buildings with significant cultural heritage were affected. The old market of Umdurman is the largest and the oldest market in Khartoum area was destroyed by a fire. It was almost completely destroyed. You can see here from the picture on the left, uh, it's uh, before the fire and on the right after the destroy. Unfortunately, the range of the danger is, is expanding and more heritage sites in Sudan are threatened every day. As you know, the war is still going and every day there is a new fire, there is a new building destroyed, there is um, a new heritage is threatened. So we have to preserve this rich cultural heritage um, with the advancement of digital technologies, preservation technique have be developed significantly, including terrestrial laser scanning, close range photogrammetry, aerial photogrammetry and unmanned aerial vehicle. All of these are types of uh, photogrammetry we can use to um, uh, preserve cultural heritage. For our uh, study, we chose um, photogrammetry and specifically close range photogrammetry. Uh, photogrammetry itself is a technology that helps uh, the automatic building of a 3D model for any object by combining multiple photos. It has been the most widely used technique for cultural heritage documentation for its ability to work with measurements using visual and digital media and appropriateness in terms of time, space, and cost. Close range photogrammetry has a lot of advantages we can see it's, uh, it, it can work with a large amount of data, various scales and resolutions. It's accurate. Uh, it can create accurate three D dimensional model, three dimensional model of objects, texture data with provide realistic look. Less costly equipment and final products are provided under strict time requirements. All of these reasons we chose it to um, to apply it on our study. On, other, on, on the other hand, photogrammetry disadvantages includes the requirement of medium to high-end software and devices. This issue has become less concerning during the last decade since the rapid declining of digital systems and the camera's costs. Um, and many low-end and low-price software have become available. The process includes three main steps, scanning, mesh generation and modeling, and rendering. The scanning is achieved by taking as many photos as possible, covering all object sites at 360 degrees from different distances and different levels, heights. Mesh generation and modeling, the captured photo are then imported into a photogrammic, uh, photogrammatic software, such as Metashape, which works in three steps, aligning the photos, building the mesh, and then building the texture as extracted from the pictures. And then the last step is rendering. Here you can see the mesh uh, before and after the texture was added. For our study, we conducted two case studies to apply the photogrammetry technique. The first historical object is one of the tombs in Healy, uh, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the United Arab Emirates that goes back to 3000 uh, BCE. This is the tomb. The second object is the remain of a wall found in the surroundings of Elbidia Mosque in the Fujaira Emirate, also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as it's the oldest mosque in the United Arab Emirate. This is the remaining of the wall. Both locations were scanned using a phone camera, Samsung A52. Although a phone camera is professional, the resolution of captured photos are, uh, and the texture of the created 3D model are considerably high and realistic. You can see from the, the model on the left after uh, texturing, and here is the real picture. It's almost um, very realistic. Also, this is the wall. This is the model. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Metashape software. 
after um, aligning the photos, texturing, and everything before the rendering. And here is the real picture. You can see also the good result. The heliotomp model showed mesh deformation because of a strong contrast of a tree shadow. This was an issue in uh, taking the pictures. You can see here the deformation of the mesh. And these are the cause of this deformation. It's the strong contrasted, uh, the strong contrast of a tree shadow. The strong contrast issue was avoided in the wall object by scanning the building on a cloudy day with diffuse sunlight. Nonetheless, a deformation was observed in the upper part of the model because all images were captured using a mobile camera from the ground level and no drone was available to capture the top side of the object or any details higher than the human eye level. We can see here uh, the upper side is missing because there was no pictures available for this side. So the software couldn't complete this uh, part of the model. Overall, the process was straightforward and did not require any training or prior experience. Only a course in photogrammetry was undertaken with the student academy to learn how to scan building uh, using a phone and how to utilize the software such as Metashape uh, to achieve the best results. It was a very nice experience. To summarize, um, we have some advantages or opportunities and disadvantages and challenges um, we, we can face when using closer range photogrammetry to safeguard the Sudanese cultural heritage. Um, the advantages can be cost effectiveness and affordability of closer range photogrammetry, easy to learn and user friendly, reliable technical knowledge of staff in Sudan, the existence of a huge digital library for Sudanese historical sites. Also, the, the disadvantages can be the continuity of the armed conflict until this day, poor accessibility to many locations, lack of awareness uh, of the importance of digitization. Also, um, the advantages can be the possibility to reconstruct a digital version of any object from existing digital data, which is available. Uh, digitization projects have already begun in Sudan since 2013 possibility to get support from concerned organization re regionally and internationally. The challenges can be lack of coordination in Sudanese institutions, low institutional support, and insufficient initial funding and financial uh, sustainability. In conclusion, the application of photogrammetry to preserve threatened cultural heritage in Sudan is a challenging but achievable task. With low-cost equipment, minimally trained staff, access to all data and funding resources, creating a digital version of these priceless cultural assets is promising. This approach is an effective way to preserve national heritage for the future generations while mitigating the risks associated with the physical damage and the de uh, destruction of these artifacts. Sudan is shaping its identity by building on its culture, uh, cultural heritage as it emerges from strife. And photogrammetry technologies appear to be the ideal solution for preserving this cultural heritage through digitization. Governmental authorities, non-governmental organizations, and other in interested parties need a coordination plan, identification of possible source of funding, and training program. While it may not be possible to replace missing monuments, pres preserving them digitally is less risky than entirely losing them. Thank you very much. Ask me anything. This is Dua Abdul Halim, and uh, with you is Akram, Dr. Akram Al Khalifa. Thank you very much. I hope you hear the applause. It is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience to this presentation? Maybe first, um, Dua, from which country are you actually um, joining us? Where are you right now? Right now, I'm uh, at the United Arab Emirates. Okay, so... Um, this is why we, we conducted the two case studies in the United Arab Emirates, not from Sudan. Okay, so you are in the Emirates right now. We already yeah. learned today that we even had people from South America joining, so wow. people come from all over the world. So we are really happy you made it and that you prepared so well. Thank you very Thank much you. for your contribution. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. See you. We stay in contact. Thank you. Thank you.
So, now we continue in presence with a German student paper. The pink one? The pink one? Okay, so um, now already good evening, everybody. Uh, we are Sophie and Simon, and we are from the University of Applied Sciences Bonn Rhein Sieg, and we will present you uh, our paper uh, with the title "Exploring the Boundaries of uh, Digitalization of Cultural Heritage: Opportunities, Challenges, and Future Directions." And skip the agenda. And first, I will give you a short overview about our project that we did in Jordan because this was. Uh, led us to, to the idea for this paper. And it was always, uh, also used as an example for the digitalization process in our paper. And our goal was to um, create 3D models from this hand and this elbow from a Hercules statue that is in Jordan, uh, Amman Citadel. And we used two different uh, techniques. So we, uh, or we used two different approaches. We took uh, photos and used the classical photogrammetry approach um, that was already presented here. So we took a lot of uh, pictures and then used Metashape for creating a 3D model. But we also used uh, um, an approach uh, with our phones and we used the Scanniverse app that is available on iOS to uh, create the 3D models. And the key points were, I mean, the first one is kind of obvious, but uh, still important that the more data and the more detailed the data is, or the more pictures you have or the more um, detailed the video is, the better will be the results. And on the other hand, we found out that it's pretty easy and accessible for us to create a 3D model just with our phones and with an app. So already there we uh, asked ourselves is this, if this isn't a great opportunity and if there's where this development of the technology leads us and if there are some further chances. Um, yeah, so, but before talking about the opportunities and maybe also the risks um, of this digitalization, we first want to understand where are we right now. So we uh, imagine ourselves 100 years ago where we have to digitalize, not the digitalize, but where we have to preserve somehow or archive somehow um, uh, cultural heritage and we have to write everything down or we draw uh, some things and everything is just in one specific library and you have to be on site to access these data. And now in the digital area, we're already there that we have uh, global accessibility, hopefully. I mean, we discussed this uh, before the coffee break, that um, in the best case, everybody on the world can have access to the data and can use it for uh, scientific research um, or whatever. And then there's also a future where we imagine that this could be even more, um, even easier to search in this data or browse this data uh, with the assistant of AI. And we ask ourselves, where are these boundaries um, of this uh, evolution? And where are also the risks and the challenges of this? And yeah, this will tell Sophie. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm Sophie. So Simon just gave you a very quick overview about the uh, evolution of the digitalization of cultural heritage. So, and then we just started our research on possible challenges in the process. And even though we were quite amazed by how easy it is to just simply take a little video or pictures, and then you have a small little 3D model on your phone, we realized depending on the size of the object you want to digitalize, you will need some greater technologies. If we saw in previous presentations, lot of blurriness or lags because especially the roofs maybe you will need drones and that can be quite costly and of course um, depending on the quality you will need even like if it's for a museum maybe you want something very specialized then you will need skilled personnel that will know everything about meta shape or even laser scanning or photogrammetry that will just make sure the quality is very high and yeah we just talked a lot about the blurriness and the lack of uh, the missing pieces because if you want to really digitalize an object in its completeness you will have need hundred thousands of pictures in every detail because you, uh, we saw in the middle east there are so many mosaics and there's so many eye to detail 
And of course, depending on the location, for example, you will need a clear planning on the resource allocation. Every digitalization must be final, uh, financed and maybe uh, the transportation uh, is a bit tr difficult, may even uh, maybe it's in the desert or somewhere and all the technology needs to be down there. And if you use like AI or machine learning uh, algorithms, of course, there are also risks using them. If you, for example, you train in algorithms and there are many errors in your database you train them on that can lead to in um, to wrong results in maybe in recon uh, reconstruction or whatever you will need them to. And yeah, some cultural challenges are there's actually quite a debate going on whether it helps or harms the tourism because on one hand, yeah, maybe it sparks the curiosity and people want to go because they saw a, a 3D model and they just want to see how it is. But of course, on the other hand, maybe they saw it online and feel like, okay, I've been there, I don't have to see it. So there's like pro and cons there. And a very big problem is actually uh, about the ownership and intellectual property rights. Um, it just can create issues if you have maybe a museum and a government and the communities the artifacts originate from and they all claim or, uh, ownership because if you have a digital replica, who does it belong to? You cannot just go to a country, make a digitalized version of something and put it online. And yeah, depending on that, there's many discussions from and it can maybe have a bit of a discussion. And of course, there is depending on the artifact, there are artifacts that just have a deep spirituality or a cultural sensitivity to it uh, for specific communities. And that just needs this sensitivity. And when you put something online and you share it with the world, you just have to really make sure to value their cultural aspects and their belief systems. Um, but yeah, despite all of the challenges, uh, which cannot really be solved, it's a thing of many discussions. And every time you want to digitalize something, you have to make sure to just go through each of these steps. Um, of course, there are huge opportunities. You have you can create a global accessibility of artifacts uh, because it's just not possible for everyone to go to and you will just remove all the geographical and financial aspects of it and everyone who's interested is able to see it and by having maybe high quality replicas of an object will help reconstruct it uh, in case of damages or losses and yeah it can enhance tourism for example it will never replace in, uh, if you have a model, it will never really show you how it's really been. You need the climate and you need to stand there and the light and everything. So yeah, I would say it does enhance it. And with AR and VR technologies, you can even be able to maybe interact with it, maybe walk through the villages. You can you maybe saw these glasses and it's actually amazing what technology can do there. And yeah, we, heard, we hear a lot about AI technologies uh, at the moment. And even though it's very time consuming training these algorithms, maybe some of you did that already, um, it can definitely help filtering the data and classify the artifacts because of these huge databases, which will save a huge amount of time and resources. Um, because for example, um, if you want to reconstruct something, the AI algorithms will be able to identify the patterns. Uh, which will just make it way faster to um, yeah, realize where to fill in missing pieces. And um, of course, you also do not need as much skilled uh, personnel, for example, to just identify an object or if you found something and you want to know, okay, to which community or which place does it belong to because of these <laughs> algorithms. But of course, it needs a very high initial investment, but it can lead to long-term resource savings. So um, what we found out is just opportunities and risks just coexist. Every time you want to digitalize something, you would want to share it with the world. You just have to make sure that you talk to the owners and to make sure every of these challenges can be resolved and you do not harm people or anything. And there was actually a German UNESCO commission and they had a talk about this in October 2023 and they uh, published an article about this because they also identified all the um, 
chances and challenges of AI and digitalization of cultural heritage and how it can support, for example, scientific research, uh, research and yeah, all the opportunities we just talked to. But um, yeah, they also realized that all these ethical and co legal concerns um, require uh, regulations, but these are very difficult because all the technologies changes over time. It's really dependent on which country is it and how it's their legal system and how do we do this. So it's, um, yeah, it's just open to discussion. So there's no really single solution on how to deal with it. You just have to balance it and make sure you have the sensitivity because it's, as we talked a lot about it, it's a cultural heritage system. It's not something, it's not just pure data. It actually means a lot to these people. So yeah, this is uh, our, uh, sh sorry, uh, some of our reference that are new. And thank you so much for listening. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, thank you very much. Are there any questions from our audience? Yeah, Basim. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, actually, I read a lot about the use of AI in uh, cultural heritage preservation. Uh, I uh, like uh, face some debates in this regard. So uh, I give you an example. If we put like uh, a missing part to uh, a particular object, so how to validate that this part is okay and this is like the original one? Uh, mm. So would we uh, make the AI create our history and contribute to the past? So I don't know. What's your comment about that? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course, there's no very specific answer to that, but it's absolutely right. Of, on one hand, you say, okay, no, this is not, it's not the entire heritage. It will, it's just a missing piece that AI filtered in. On the other hand, it will complete a picture and it will give you a p very good vision on maybe how it looked before and maybe helps in understanding. Um, I Personally, I think for me, it helps if there is something destroyed and there is a model next to it. For me personally, it's very helpful. But of course, you need to very specify, and this is AI, and this is how it really looked before. So I'd say you shouldn't just say no to it just because it's not maybe the clear answer, but you have to very to make it very clear what is AI. Just like if you write a paper and you want to reference everything, this is exactly the same thing, I think. It's just an opinion, though. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, you need the the one team is the specialist technology and computer science team who do do the good scan, but you need an archaeologist beforehand who will point out and say, "Look, this is already renovated or it's not original." But the point is, what is original when you're in the Middle East? It's like one layer over another, over another, over another. It's like really interesting first, like the, there was like some sultan, then the Romans came, then the crusaders came, then the sultan da -da -da came, then the Turkish guys came, you know, and it's like this and everything is real. But the point is you need an archaeologist who has the knowledge to, to say this is from this period and um, it's not fake, it's real. And then you can do the scanning and then you need some um, like... At the moment, we do like we say we used AI for like making it quicker, faster, or to repair it. And I had a one day debate about in Lebanon where somebody showed a model and then somebody was crying, No, it wasn't blue, it was like pink, like the statues have been painted. But you don't know. Um, at the end, you find out like um, the professionals, the scientists are quarreling, and you just say at the end you don't know how it actually really looked like and I think that's the same it's like we used artificial intelligence to like repair it but we actually don't know how it originally looked like it just has to be named on the bottom maybe so that the people don't believe always what they see yeah so that you need additional information hmm. and maybe another comment uh, on this uh, in my in my opinion, we should use uh, AI or could be used right now uh, in the same way we maybe use ChatGPT. So we have some suggestions, and it helps us to have some possible. You, you use the example that something fits in, right? 
uh, that they have some possible options that is right. And then in the end, uh, human being still decides if that makes sense, um, but it helps to have the process more efficient. So it's, it helps to save some time. Yeah. Okay. More questions or discussions? Thank you very much for this contribution. So last but not least, the last presentation is by Zeynep. It's an online presentation. So I see you are already logged in. Hello. Can Hello. you share the screen? What? Please try to share your screen. Yes, one second. Uh, just a stop. Perhaps I need to do a stop first. So under the images in the middle, you should have a button that is TEI. Yes, great. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you. So the floor is all yours. Okay. One second. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Zainab Ahmad from University of uh, Khartoum. And I'm here to present uh, the paper titled Digitization of Cultural Heritage Using Photogrammetry, the case of al Bidya Mosque. This paper was written by Dua Abdel Halim who presented uh, earlier, and Dua Abdurrahman, uh, Muhammad Al-Mushtaba, uh, and myself, of course. Okay, so uh, cultural heritage of a nation, of course, forms its identity inherited uh, from past generation and passed to the next. Therefore, it's crucial to preserve it uh, from natural and human effects, and of course, from extension. And throughout time, several approaches were utilized to, pres uh, to preserve the cultural heritage from describing it by text. Uh, so you would use your own imagination and uh, to moving to drawing and paintings. So it, the, the style and um, the technique of the artist influenced the paintings, of course. Then 200 years ago, we were uh, introduced to photographs. And moving from that, we have modern day digitized 3D models uh, pointed clouds with coordinates, which achieve the higher accuracy and more realistic results. So the objectives of our paper was to explore the capabilities and limitation of close uh, range uh, photogrammetry when used uh, to document and preserve tangible architectural heritage and to evaluate the effectiveness of using non-professional tools and also unprofessional people like unexperienced users uh, in the, the digitization process. And uh, lastly, to create a 3D model of Albedia Mosque using simple, low budget uh, equipment. And we wanted to create that model to document its current status, keeping in mind that uh, it went through intensive uh, maintenance. Uh, for example, they added electricity, they maintained uh, the walls, the exterior walls. So keep that in mind. And enabling remote access and virtual tours to the site and enhance the research, education, and awareness. So uh, photogrammetry, as you know by now, of course, uh, is the technique to obtain precise 3D data from 2D photographs. And what makes photogrammetry uh, dominant um, in that field, in my opinion, is uh, the generation of textures and colors, um, I'm mimicking the visual aspect. Uh, of the structure under study. And also it's easy to learn. It's user-friendly, enabling users with varying levels of uh, expertise to generate meaningful 3D models. So uh, our case study, as I said, it's Albidia Mosque. It's uh, located in Al Fujairah, which is one of the Emirates in United Arab Emirates. And it's located on the East Coast, built in the 15th century uh, for unknown architects. And it's the oldest mosque in the United Arab Emirates. So what made us uh, opt for it? Of course, number one, it's history because it's the oldest, but also for its um, accessibility. We struggled for two months with the official bodies to gain access or gain permission to take uh, photos, but were either rejected without giving any reason or just ignored. So the mosque advantage that it was operational, meaning um, it's open, people use it, so we didn't need uh, to deal with the formalities. We just went there. And uh, uh, the third point is the architectural uniqueness. It's unique engineering system. 
um, considering that area at that time. So it has four spiral, like uh, as you can see in the uh, as you can see in the images on the right, it has four spiral uh, stepping domes of varying size, and it's supported by a central pillar. Um, and we know that the domes were not local architectural choice, and it's probably a foreign influence that did not catch on or didn't last for, for us to see. And the material used for the mosque matched most of the historical buildings in the area. So they built it using adult brick, uh, plastered with mud and some sand to obtain a, a smoother finish. And uh, the interior walls are decorated with uh, primitive carvings, eight small openings that allow light. I'm sorry, you're gonna see the interior in the next slides. Um, to allow lights and air to enter and niches uh, for lamps. The prayer hall features uh, a small mihrab and a simple pulpit and arches. And the domes turn to be pointed, uh, smooth domes when looking, when looking um, from the inside. So the methodology we used was close range uh, terrestrial photogrammetry. And we used our personal phones uh, there were three of us. We sat our cameras uh, manually um, to match, uh, to match uh, the settings together. And we took as many pictures as possible, th uh, 360, and uh, covering the building also from different heights. And after that acquisition, we moved to data processing. So alignment, mesh generation, and texture mapping using MetaShape Agisoft. But it did not work, as you can see in the first image. Um, so we went again, manually eliminated uh, any distorted image, discarded the images with people, zoomed photos, and those with shadow, and also poor quality. And uh, we tried calibration again, and it worked. You can see it in the second image. And uh, now we have a model. We took it from, uh, Meet, uh, from uh, MetaShape and went for model refinement. We went using two, uh, two uh, directions. So we used Blender, uh, for, uh, Blender for the interior and we used Rhino for the exterior. And we modeled uh, the missing elements, manually filled the gaps and reconstructed the missing architectural features. And then again, for the visualization, we went, used D5 for the interior and we used Lumion for the exterior. And as you can see, the result was we successfully created the detailed 3D model uh, of the mosque. We captured the, the significant architectural details uh, and we have a video also to showcase the potential of virtual tours and virtual and or VR technology. The challenges that we faced was, uh, of course, uh, in, especially in the inside, uh, poor lighting, we, as I said, it's an open site, so tourists uh, could enter the site, and uh, the lack of professional grade equipments, we used our smartphones, and the limitation of terrestrial approach in capturing roof. Um, we couldn't capture the roof, we could capture it only from the mountain side, because we had to climb the mountain and take pictures from that side, but the other three sides we couldn't, so we had to model it ourselves. And uh, yeah, you can see the interior and you can see the exterior. It also has a, um, a historical will that people use for evolution in the outside. We also captured it. And, that, uh, and this is the interior. So these are the pulpit, the mihrab, uh, the carvings and the openings to allow light. And lastly, in the discussion, uh, I, I, I know by now all of you know the, the advantages and disadvantages and the challenges. I just wanted to address the point of, uh, that we found in one of the papers that we were studying. It's uh, the death of authenticity. So it debates that uh, moving to a virtual uh, reality, uh, especially intangible artifacts, mean you lose the experience, you lose the real experience. Um, of the site, the texture, the sound, uh, you don't feel it at the same. And we don't argue on that part, but we can say that having something is better than having nothing. And uh, 
lots of natural disasters and wars have taught us that we can lose these artifacts in a, in, in a minute. And uh, also consider that we have a second epidemic like Corona, where you can't go anywhere. And it's good to have uh, the option of a virtual tour, even for academic purposes, for student uh, school trips, for example. And uh, I see that it's beneficial on the long term. Maybe the only downside that can be, how can we experience it in the virtual reality itself? And for our future recommendation, we would recommend going for a hybrid uh, technique, uh, like using photogrammetry terrestrial with airborne or uh, using mix of different technologies like photogrammetry and laser scanning, for example. And that's it. Thank you. Yes, sign up. I hope you heard your applause. Yeah, I, I did. Know. Oh, you did. That's very important yeah. because they, this is especially for you. Um, we are so happy you made it to this conference and it all worked out at the end. We had some struggles in the, yeah. at lunchtime to get yeah. you in. Um, it was um, on our side. Um, but we finally made it. So I'm really happy it works out. And you're in the Emirates right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, you're in the Emirates. Okay. So thanks for coming and waiting and presenting. And we are happy it worked all fine. I'm but happy um, to now here. to ask, are there any questions? Yes, Alan. Alan is a student from Tisch um, International University in Erbil. And he has a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask, is the interiors and the exteriors linked? So is it like one model or two separate no, models? It was two separate models because we tried to have it in one model and it did not work. The software could not place exactly the pieces. So in the end, we had to, we had to separate the interior uh, pictures from the exterior pictures and treat them differently. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So thank you. Any more questions? No? Okay. So sign up. Thank you very much. That, that's it. Yeah. Have a great afternoon and evening and we stay in contact. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye. So and I'll now come forward to gather with Julia. Are there any things you want to say at the end? We have to say thank you to the yes. technicians. I'm awed by every presentation and also They're still by here. your, <laughs> by your still discipline. Here. Yeah. By your discipline. Thanks so much. So. 20 presentations. Okay. One was ill. 19 presentations. We stick to the time. This is not evident and it's really, mm. it was great. It, it was, was great. really hybrid. And after, after some struggles in the beginning, I think we really did well. I was afraid. Um, actually, I was expecting even more challenges that like people come late or miss the time or do, not able to log in. I'm, I was afraid of a lot of like having Wi-Fi problems um, yeah. for the people, not switch, getting the cameras on and so on. So it, I think it worked pretty well for the first time to try it out. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so from all my heart, thank you. Shukancha Silan. All the best. <laughs> Thanks from my part, from your part, I think. Yeah. Big applause for all of you. <laughs> so enjoy the evening, have a safe trip home and hope to see you soon in a similar or other setting. Thanks for this day. Bye bye. About the restaurant, I'm, I'm going